show started, as the show was getting underway, you know, Woods seemed like he was a little bit more chipper than Ben. Ben looked like he had been hit by a truck. And then they just slowly started to just fall apart on the show with their illness. So hopefully they get back ready to go for Tuesday. We will not have any shows coming up on Monday for President's Day. So we'll all be off here on 97 through the fan. Ben and Woods will be back on Tuesday after they knock out this uh, little sickness of theirs. And we'll be uh, good to go back on Tuesday. But until then, I'll take you up on your morning commute on a Friday, get you ready for a nice three-day weekend for some of you that are celebrating the three-day weekend, like myself. Although I don't know how much of a weekend it is with all of my work requirements, which is fine. I don't mind it. I have a good time over at USD. My schedule this weekend, or leading up this week, I, I had softball on Wednesday night. Not me playing softball, but me doing softball. USD versus San Diego State. Last night, USD men's basketball against Portland. Big comeback win for the Toreros. The cardiac kids, as Steve Lavin said when he was leaving the court. They were down by 13 points against Portland, rallied all the way back, and ended up beating Portland by a couple of points to even up their record at 6-6 six and six in West Coast Conference play. So good for Steve Lavin and company. They've won five of the last six out of the last seven in West Coast Conference play. It's great for the USD Toreros. That leads into today, obviously, with the illness of Ben and Woods uh, and Paul getting the day off. I am in the captain's chair to run the show, which when I thought about it, of whether I wanted to, I wanted to do this. I was thinking about how much lack of sleep I was going to have the last couple, the next couple of days. But then I realized that the perk of getting your ass up in the morning to do this show. I don't know how these guys do it every day. I've talked to Adam about that a couple of times with his experience working morning shows in the past. I don't know how you do it every day. Everybody always says it goes into a routine. Today wasn't too bad getting up. I was excited to get up in the morning. It's one of those, you know, those times when you're a kid. And Christmas was the next day or some big event was the next day. You couldn't sleep because you couldn't wait to get up. That was me this morning. So when I was thinking about signing up for this show today, I was like, oh, I'm not going to get too much sleep. But then I remember the perk of this job of doing the morning shows. I'm off by 10. It's great. You'll be off by 10. We could take a nap. Because on Saturday, I got three more games at USD. Women's basketball at 2. Softball at 4. And men's basketball at seven. Huge game for the Toreros on Saturday night for men's basketball. They play Santa Clara. So all of that on Saturday. I'll have my own show, the Brayton Sopranos show on 97.3 The Fan, coming up on Sunday from 8 to 10. Weekend programming on The Fan. Look forward to that. We've been doing that the last couple of weeks now. Finally getting into the routine of doing Sundays after the NFL ended. So be sure to tune in each and every Sunday morning from 8 to 10. It's going to be great during the Padres season. Nice little recap from the night before leading into a Sunday morning game, Sunday afternoon, right into Sam Levitt. It's going to be a great, great window for Padres content on the weekends. But that continues again coming up on Sunday from 8 to 10. The Brayton Supreme Show on 97.3 The Fan. You can follow me on all social media platforms if you don't necessarily listen to my shows, I'm on Annie Nelson each and every day from 10 to 2. I also have the weekend show, as I mentioned, on Sundays from 8 to 10. You can follow me on all social media. That would be, you know, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, the usual, at B underscore S-U-R-P, as we do a little bit of housekeeping. I talked about the excitement of this morning. But it's fun. You get to go up, do a new show, do a different show. I filled in for Ben and Woods a couple of times. I enjoy doing it. It's a different audience, obviously. You guys have a good time in the morning. I like to be a part of it. So I was excited to get the show on the on underway. Now, one of my friends texted me in the morning, like 4.30 in the morning, saying, good morning, Braden. He knew I was doing the show. I was like, good morning, Sam. Thanks. Good morning, Zach. Multiple text messages in the morning to my response of, why are you excited for the morning as much as I am? And that kind of relates to Padres baseball right now. The excitement level for the Padres in 2024. I'm not sure if I'm excited yet. I don't really know. It's still in that kind of tweener time. 
with spring training. And it's a little bit different, Padres fans. Wasn't the exciting offseason you're used to seeing? The big splash that A.J. Preller always makes via a free agent pickup, via a trade, a blockbuster trade. Sure, they traded away one Soto, but that's not necessarily the fun trades that Padres fans have grown accustomed to. Coming off a disappointing season last year, obviously, a lot of different expectations. Coming off a tough and sad offseason where you lose Peter Seidler, who's been a mainstay of this organization and the lifeblood of this organization. Has brought so much joy to Padres fans of the last couple of years with his family and ownership. Not the usual happy, excited Padres fan base. And I understand that. I get that. Totally understand. And on today, the first day of everybody reporting to camp, it's report day today. Pitchers and catchers reported on Sunday. The entire team's coming today. What's your excitement level, Padres fans? Are you excited for 2024? Are you excited for the season? Are you going into the season going like the Padres have a really good chance of winning the National League West? Are you going into the season going it's a for sure foregone conclusion that the Padres are going to make the wild card if they don't win the division with the Dodgers team that loaded up during the offseason? Are you excited for the 2024 season? I know you're not as excited as you were last year. I'm not. But I don't necessarily know that's because the Potters are going to be disappointing in 2024. I can make my case for that. But it was always going to be a little bit less exciting this year than it was last year, just based on the fact that they were coming off of beating the Dodgers in a playoff series, signing Xander Bogarts, had the top four, everything was being placed out in front of them. They had World Series expectations. Fan Fest was nuts. How excited are you in 2024? It's an interesting topic of discussion because of everything that is playing into the season. And at the same time, an incomplete team. It's not complete yet. They still have spots that need to be filled that the Padres have already talked about. They are looking to try to fill especially in the outfield, probably looking for more starting pitching. They're still rumored to have some interest in guys like Hyun Jun Ryu. We'll see how that plays out. But do you have to table your expectations and really wait for when the roster is complete and the job is finished? We were talking about it off air about how you can't judge something until it's complete. I made the same case on Andy Nelson when we're looking at the Pocota rankings, we're looking at the preseason ratings, we're looking at you know what the win totals are going to be for the Padres. Then I brought up the point of like, why do we care about what these are when you don't have a center fielder or a left fielder? When you don't really have a first baseman or a DH. Even if you plug Jay Cronenworth in at first base, you still don't have a DH on the roster. You're missing pieces. I was talking with Adam Klug before the show. He told me a story about what Doug Gottlieb used to say all the time. Don't make a judgment on a team until you see the whole team. And he brought up a point about when he was remodeling his kitchen, remodeling some room, and they started painting that room. His wife hated it. That was terrible. It wasn't even close to being done. It was just like, just start a bit. It looks terrible. It sucks. They can't do it. Which is kind of like the Padres right now, right? They don't have Juan Soto anymore. They're only outfielders for Nando. Who's going to play first base? Is Jake Cronenworth really a second baseman? Is he a first baseman? What are you going to do with Hassan Kim? Who's going to be the designated hitter? Who starts a game for the Padres on the hill after Michael King, assuming that Darvish and Musgrove start the first two games? 
How many of these guys are going to make the bullpen? That the room is slowly getting painted. It's not done yet. The room of the Padres 2024 team is not done yet. That color that you're seeing on the wall might not look very good in one of the corners of the room. But it's not done yet. Talk to me when it's done. Talk to me when that roster is complete. When that room is finally painted. The Gottlieb in that entire phrase went on to say, his wife ended up loving the room and loving the paint color that they decided to pick when they remodeled this room. When it was all done. So what's your excitement level, Padres fans? For me, and this is it's very interesting. Like, I, I'm not in a spot right now. I still think it's kind of early. I mean, you're in that kind of no man's land spark. Part in sports, right? I mean, it's the NBA All Star Weekend this weekend. I didn't even know it was that that was a thing until I heard Maggie and Perloff say it on the lead-in show from CBS Sports Network. We don't have an NBA team. I don't need to pay attention to it as much. But you're at the NBA All Star Weekend. You're midway through NHL. For anybody that's a diehard sports person that wants to talk about those things, college basketball still has a couple more weeks of conference play as they gear into. March Madness, they're not quite there yet. The NFL season just ended. College football's been over for a, for a month. And you got these spring training workouts where you haven't even started spring training games yet. That doesn't even start till next week. And the only reason why it's starting this early is because the Padres are playing in one of the early games. So it's tough to get super excited for baseball in general. So again, I mean, this seems to be another topic of discussion that's rolled around through San Diego, at least in the walks of life that I've been a part of. How excited are you for the Padre season? I'm not as excited right now. I'm looking at the room getting painted, and I'm not like the way I'm not liking the way it's shaping out. I'm not liking the color. It doesn't go with the molding or the room or maybe the floor. Something's wrong. They need to fix something. But it's not complete yet. So obviously a room that's incomplete is not going to be something that you're going to be excited for. And the Padres still think that they're going to move pieces around. There is some moves on the horizon, according to Dennis Lynn. He talked about that in his latest article. But on a scale of 1 to 10... As of right now, which I just said, you can't make a judgment based on how it's currently constructed. I'm around a five. I guarantee you when we start getting closer to March 20th, it'll be a lot higher. But as disappointing as maybe the offseason was for the Padres, as kind of bleak as it might look based on the roster, I will say this, Padres fans. They got enough superstar talent where the Padres can compete in 2024. They can. And you start breaking it down of what they got to do to make the playoffs. Because at the end of the day, in baseball in general, and Ben Woods talked to Eno Saris about this months ago, of how long a playoff series had to be in order for it to be the best team winning the World Series. It's ridiculous. So if you just make the playoffs, you're in a good spot because you have a chance. Anybody think the Diamondbacks last year, the beginning of the year, was going to make it to a World Series? I didn't. I thought they were going to make the playoffs. I think they get they'd make a run in the at the in the World Series to the World Series. You just got to make the dance, and in order to make the dance, even if you don't win the even if you don't win the division, which at this point, and I've said it before, it doesn't matter. Aside from the cool factor of being able to lay the division champs banner next to the western part of the western metal supply company building which they haven't done since what 0506 there's really no point in winning a division championship just look at los angeles just look at the dodgers and win a division championships for years they got nothing for it you just got to make the dance let the dodgers win the division who cares 
You just got to make the playoffs. Start looking at some of the teams as constructed. The Padres, with their superstars they have, albeit only three of them now instead of four, is still a lot better than a lot of different teams throughout Major League Baseball, especially teams they're competing with for a wild card spot. You make a complete roster, they got a good chance, and you never know what's going to happen in baseball. You could have a season like you did last year where the superstars didn't carry the team, or... You can have a season this year where Xander Bogarts is playing at an all-time level in his second year as a Padre. Another bounce back year for Fernando playing in right field. Manny Machado comes back from injury, or should I say surgery, and does an outstanding job. And all three of those guys have big years. You can look at starting pitching. Joe Musgrove, you Darvish, Michael King, they could all have good years. Luis Camposano can make another adjustment and be a – Great everyday starting catcher. Maybe you get some strong life out of the youth in Jackson Merrill and Graham Pauly and Jacob Marcy. So with all this uncertainty, there is reason for optimism of what things can turn out for the San Diego Padres team. And you never know in baseball. It's such a weird sport. This Padres club could go on a run. They could falter. But that's what makes it so exciting. You don't know what you're going to get in baseball. Which can't be said about a lot of different sports. So as of right now, my excitement level is a five. But the room's not done yet. It's not done painted yet. We'll see what the Padres do. We'll see what A.J. Preller's got up his sleeve. Full camp reports today. We're going to have Sam Levitt report to us live at 7 o'clock in the morning before all of the big-time players start coming in for the Padres and get us a nice little reset how everybody did on their off day yesterday leading into spring training. we got Sammy spring training coming up at 7 o'clock. Later on in the 9 o'clock hour, we will be joined by Bryce Miller, the San Diego Union Tribune. We're going to talk a little bit of Aztec basketball as well as San Diego Padres baseball coming into the season. And then at 9.30, Brock Ungrich, head coach of the USD Toreros in baseball, up a three-game series against the University of Texas down in Austin. It is the start of college baseball today. So as much as it's reporting for spring training for the Padres, every local team is in action in college baseball. We get college baseball opening day today, so we'll kind of preview the weekend for them in Austin, as well as get you a little local preview on some of the local colleges in town with San Diego State, UC San Diego, and USD all starting their conf- all starting their baseball seasons today going into the weekend and then we got a big basketball game tonight san diego state and new mexico we'll get you a full preview on that and where everything stands when it comes to the latest bracketology lots to talk about on a friday morning i'm brayton Soprenit filling in for ben and woods on san diego's number one sports station 97 through the fan From- click the um Look at the streamer thing. See if the little mic on my deal is on.
6.26 on a Friday morning. Brayden Suprenant filling in for Ben and Woods on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Got a great show planned for you guys today. What's your excitement level for the season, Padres fans? We talked about that in the last segment. We want to get to some of your phone calls as well. I know we got one on the line. We're going to get to him in just a little bit. 833-288-0973. 833-288-0973 to dial into the show today. Pretty open show in terms of wanting to join us. We do have a couple of spots taken by some guests coming up. Sam Levitt will be joining us at the top of the hour to give us an update on Padres spring training as they are reporting to camp today, all of the position players out in Peoria. We already had ourselves the pitchers and catchers reporting, but now it's the full team getting ready for full team workouts today. So that's exciting, Padres fans. A lot of incomplete and a lot of spots incomplete on this roster they can dangle the carrot with young guys as much as they want. But at this point, they are still looking around to try to find maybe an outfielder, maybe two. Talking about trading Hassan Kim. Not necessarily anything imminent, but when there's smoke, there's fire, as we talked about yesterday with Dennis Lynn's article. And that's an interesting point of conversation anyway. And we're going to get to some of that with some Xander Bogarts talk as well in just a little bit. But first, I do want to get to the phones. 833-288-0973, 833-288-0973. Joining us now, Andrew in San Diego. Andrew, what's going on? How's your morning? Good. I, I, I'm about a excitement level 4 out of 10. <laughs> I'm even lower than you, I think. But uh, that's primarily because of that rumor about Hassan Kim. Um, I think it would be kind of a travesty or tragedy to trade him right before he goes back home to his you know home country of korea to show that he's you know a major league baseball player now and i think it would just be kind of a a big uh finger like f you you can't go and play in your home country we we're gonna trade you we're gonna trade our our best you know our our most dynamic up-and-coming player is going to be a superstar i think well andrew i appreciate the phone call obviously there's a lot working for the padres from a marketing standpoint obviously from you know being a you know nice you'd be nice to not trade him before he goes to korea and there is some factors to that but you know at the end of the day the tough part with sports is you got to make and you got to make decisions that makes the roster the best and if a trade comes around where Hassan Kim could be dealt in order to get more pitching or in order to get two major league outfielders, then AJ Preller's going to have to pull the trigger on that despite where they're playing their first couple of games. That's why I think it's very interesting that Dennis Lynn had the piece about whether or not you get a compensatory pick for Hassan Kim on an in season trade. If it happens, before everybody else's season starts, that in-between time between the two games in Korea and then the regular season, which is like a week and a half before those those things happen. I mean, they're going to go play in Korea, and then they're going to come back, and they're going to play two exhibition games at home, which they used to do, against Seattle, and then they're going to start the regular season again. Hopefully with a 2-0 and record, maybe 1-1. One and one. Hopefully it's not 0-2. But to have Hassan Kim play in those two games and then trade him would also be ridiculous. Because then to me, it'd be like, well, he's our big marketing thing, Korea. And he gets to go play in his home country. So we wanted him to do that, and then we trade him. If he goes to Korea with the Padres, he better stay on the Padres for a foreseeable future, at least to the trade deadline. I'm not necessarily convinced that Hassan Kim will be a superstar. That might upset a lot of people. But if you look at his projections for this season, I mean, he's not, he's like either going flat or trending down with a lot of projected stats for Hassan Kim. 
I don't necessarily know it's going to get a lot better than what you currently have. I don't think he's a bad player. He's good. I mean, he helps the Padres out. He's a good heartbeat place for the Padres. He's a good second baseman uh, and shortstop, especially defensively. I mean, he's one of the best defensive players in all of baseball. But is he is he better than Xander Bogarts? Is Hassan Kim better than Xander Bogarts? If you had to ask, aside from contracts, if you had to ask every team in Major League Baseball, you get one of the two players from the Padres. You get Xander Bogarts, you get Hassan Kim. Who do you think they're taking? The only reason why I bring that up is because according to MLB Top 100, they got one player ranked 30 spots above the other player. We'll talk about that when we come back. Braden Zaprenit filling in for Bennett Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
638 on a Friday, getting your weekend started. How many of you guys have a three-day weekend? I got a three-day weekend. Kind of. I got Monday off from the station. Still grinding, though, on a Saturday. Three USD games, which is fun. I enjoy doing all those games. Any chance to get better at what I do, what my craft is. I'm always in favor of doing that. So I'll have three games coming up on Saturday. It's funny, earlier today in the comments, Roberto E. Ruiz, but Brayden, are you just going to be there all day today? The answer is no. I will not be on Annie and Elston today. Adam Klug will be here all day as the program director. Uh, but I will be at USD all day tomorrow. I, I should probably try to look for property uh, to buy a rent in Linda Vista with the amount of time I've spent at that school recently, but it's great. It's a good time. I have, I have a blast doing it and working with Jack Cronin uh, and the staff over at USD. So I appreciate them, of course. And then Sunday, I'm going to be back up bright and early on a Sunday morning. 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning is bright and early. Just as much as 6 a.m. is on a Friday. I will be up ready to go to give you some weekend programming. Full Daytona 500 preview, Adam, on Sunday. Just kidding. I might mention the Daytona 500, but I don't know if I'm going to be breaking that down too much. I'm not really into NASCAR. The only time I got into NASCAR was during COVID when it was the only thing going on. You had no sports, right? And then NASCAR figured out how to do it during COVID. And so I was like, well, it's better than watching them do eye racing. And, you know, we don't even know if the Padres are going to play. And who else? Who knows when? There's going to be other sports. I'll get into NASCAR. I think it was Jimmy Johnson's last year anyway. So I had a rooting interest with the San Diego guy. And I was like, so I started watching a couple of races. And I realized like on the app, like if you download the NASCAR app, it used to be free. You have to pay for it now. You could get like the comms like you would get if you went to a NASCAR event. It's like if you go to a NASCAR race, you could go get a headset and tune into what the driver and the spotter, like the teams are talking about. And so I downloaded one on my phone on the NASCAR app. It was free. Again, they were trying to get people to watch. It just blew my mind about racing and how much goes into racing more than just driving in circles and just making a bunch of left-hand turns. It was actually kind of cool. It was very fascinating. And like, it's not, it's not FCC regulated, right? So like you would hear the guys yell at each other on headset like during their during their race and the different strategies they had and they'd break it down and it was pretty interesting but i don't i mean i've never once sports started coming back i'd stop i dropped off the nascar stuff it's pretty to wild wild to think about because i had this thought in my mind a couple weeks ago like the idea of covid and there being no sports and like we as a sports station and just the sports media industry in general, like ESPN didn't stop broadcasting, right? Like nope. we didn't go off the air and trying to not only bring deliver news like ESPN does, but also entertain like we do. It's like, man, what? I mean, the, the idea that we got through COVID without sports, that was wild times. The fact that I was able to produce shows without sports was just incredible. I couldn't believe it. Right as I started producing everyday talk shows. Hey, look, pandemic. Try to figure stuff out without any sports. Uh, are, are we excited for our uh, MLB The Show game coming up later on Friday? Those are fun. I didn't mind those. Don't, we, don't remind me of those. It's great. I want to say that my lineup won that day for the pods. It was great. I don't remember who they beat that day. But we had a lot of people tuned into those things. I mean, people were like all about it. I digress on the NASCAR talk. But the Daytona 500 is on Sunday, so I wanted to get out, get that out there for all you all you uh, racing fans. NASCAR is back. Brandon in the chat reminding us that ESPN was broadcasting KBO games. That's right. I remember they were doing that. I remember for a while NASCAR was doing the iRacing. racing. I mean, you got to be desperate to watch some type of sport if you're watching NASCAR drivers play a video game at their house on television. Going to break, I talked about the difference between Xander Bogarts and Hassan Kim. Who would you rather have? Who would a lot of other teams rather have? But I'll get to that in a second. Because speaking of driving, 
We got to get to traffic. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. Good time to be out on the roads. We're not showing any problem spots at all. In fact, really not a lot of slowing either. That northbound side of the five, maybe a few brake lights taking you through Chula Vista up toward the 54. But after that, you're looking good. Westbound 52, not too bad heading out of Santee. I'm Kelly Danik with Ben and Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Adam just gave me like the steering wheel thing. I was like, oh man, Adam must have been really into the NASCAR deal. No, traffic. I'm the only show every day that doesn't do traffic updates. So it always throws me through a loop when I fill in for the morning or afternoon show and I got to talk about traffic. All right, back to what I was talking about. Hassan Kim, Xander Bogarts. I don't really want to compare these two players in general. I'm glad the Padres have both of them. I really am. But if you ask most Major League Baseball teams, they get to pick one or the other. No questions asked. Don't worry about money. You can afford either. Don't have to worry about money. Just strictly, who would you rather have on your team? Xander Bogarts or Hassan Kim? I would imagine most teams probably pick Xander Bogarts. If the top 100 players right now determine that, they would agree that Xander Bogarts would be the player that you would pick over Hassan Kim. Now, he really dropped in the rankings last year going into the season. He was number 32. Xander's now up to down to 53 top 100 players. Hassan Kim is currently at 88, was even ranked last year. So you could make the argument that Hassan Kim is trending up and Xander Bogarts is trending down. But I'd like to say, and here's the thing with Xander. I do think he gets a little bit, it's it's kind of interesting. Like He gets a little bit of an unfair shake because it was his first year last year and the Padres dished him out a big contract. And a lot of like, I don't really think he gets hate. Like, I don't think any Padres fan dislikes Xander Bogarts. I think all of them... I don't want to speak for you Padres fans, but I feel like the majority of Padres fans agree that love having Xander on the team, don't necessarily like his contract, which I think is fair. I think it's fair, but it's not his fault. I mean, it's not his fault. AJ Preller gave him a, a deal where he's getting $25 million a year. It's not his fault. It was also his first year. How many times have we seen a Padre in his first year not live up to expectations? And his year wasn't too bad. I mean, he started the year off great. And then he had the wrist injury, went down. And then once he got those quarter zone shots, he started to come, come back up again. And he could have a great year in his second year. But Xander Bogarts is one of the best players in Major League Baseball. Is he going to be a shortstop for the next five, six years? I don't know. I wouldn't move him to first base yet. I think that'd be kind of ridiculous. I'm not in favor of just moving players to move players. I feel like we're constantly trying to shove a square peg into a round hole a lot on this Padres team. I don't need to move Xander Bogarts to first. I know Hassan Kim's your best defensive shortstop on the team. He's better than he's got more range than Xander. I mean, he's a better shortstop than Xander. I don't think there's going to be a lot of people that argue with that. But here's the here's the thing. Are you willing to give Hassan Kim Xander Bogart's contract? I'm not. I'm not. If Xander Bogarts wasn't on the team, would you give him that contract? I know a lot of fans would. I probably wouldn't. Also, Kim's a good player. He's a good fan favorite. You can have good players. They don't all have to be superstars. Not every player that has good years is a superstar. Also, Kim's a good major league player. As I mentioned on the top 100 players right now, you can take it for what it's worth. Major League Baseball thinks there's 87 players better than Hassan Kim. Let me ask Padres fans this question. What's the difference between a superstar and a star? How highly ranked in the top 100 players list do you need to be 
to be considered a superstar. Are all players in the top 100 a superstar? I would disagree with that. Would you consider William Contreras or Wilson Contreras superstars? I wouldn't say they're stars. I wouldn't say they're superstars. They're both ranked in front of Hassan Kim. Is J.D. Martinez a superstar? Former superstar, maybe. Not a superstar anymore. He's ranked three spots in front of Hassan Kim. And I know we're talking about where he projects in the future, but again, with Hassan Kim, and I don't want this to turn into like I don't like Hassan Kim, because I do. I, I like Hassan Kim. Padres are better with him on the team than they are without him. But he's already 28. And in Hassan Kim's career, and again, it's trending upwards. In his career, his OPS plus is 100. 100. Which means he is an average Major League Baseball player, according to that metric. Now, last year, he played above that at a 110 OPS plus. There's a lot of great stuff with his defense. But he's got to get a shortstop style contract. He's going to get his, and especially with inflation nowadays, he's going to get a Xander Bogarts level contract. Which the Padres, we already know, can't afford to hand those out anymore. And if I am handing out one of those contracts, it's not for a player that hits 245 in his career. He had 17 bombs last year, hit 260, played a lot of games, we know, 110 OPS plus. Even if that was his career stats, it was a career year for Hassan Kim. If those were his career stats, I wouldn't give him $25 million a year. I wouldn't do it. Here's the other thing that's the downside to Hassan Kim. Oh, he's going to get Xander money. He's a shortstop. Absolutely. Somebody's going to pay him that. I know Ray in the chat said there's no way he gets Xander, but somebody's going to give him Xander money. If you think you're going to get Hassan Kim for cheaper than that in this day and age, you're 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 lying to yourself. Or Hassan Kim had a bad year. I mean, he him and his agent are going to get him that kind of contract. He hasn't accomplished as much as Xander Bogarts, but he's entering at the same time of his career. And he will get paid as a shortstop. Somebody will give him Xander Bogarts money. I mean, look at some. I mean, Sean and I got $14 million a year. Are you kidding me? You don't think Hassan Kim's going to get $25 million a year? They're going to pay. Somebody's going to pay him that. Are you willing to spend that kind of money to keep him around? I'm not. So with that being said, again, the back to the 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 conversation about trading Hassan. I'm tired of talking about it because they're not going to do anything in the near future. We saw that with Dennis Lynn's article yesterday. But some of the negatives towards Hassan Kim have nothing to do with Hassan. The Padres made their decision on who the future middle infielder was going to be when they gave Jake Cronenworth a contract extension last year. That was the decision they made, which was $12 million a year. Hassan Kim's definitely getting more than that. You better hope Jake Cronenworth can start living up to his contract contracts in Padres history. And he could, he could bounce back. But he's also another player that's aging and trending in the opposite direction. That's, another, that's a strike for Hassan Kim. The other strike to Hassan Kim is is you already paid a shortstop $25 million a year, and you're not going to move him to first base in the near future. And if you pay Hassan Kim the same contract you pay Xander Bogarts, then you would have to move him to shortstop. Then you got other problems. It's just, it's not making any sense to keep him. But the other thing that doesn't make any sense is trading him after he plays two games in Korea. You either trade him now or you wait to the deadline. Because I don't think... You're going to be able to re-sign him at the end of the season, and if you do, you got to you got to you got to be working some AJ Preller magic on that one. Because Hassan Kim already gave Jung Hoo Lee some advice on on some things he should have put into his contract, and a lot of them being opt outs. He would have already opted out. It sounds like. Don't know that for sure. Very interesting conversation moving forward. 
when it comes to Hassan Kim. But again, I mean, as much as, and I think the only negative on Xander Bogart seems to be his contract right now. But at this point in time, he's a way better player than Hassan Kim. According to rankings, according to statistics, I think Xander's going to have a bounce back year. I really do. I think the Padres are going to really understand, or Padres fans are really going to understand why they signed Xander Bogarts after this after the season. And he's going to have to have a big season if the Padres are going to want to make the playoffs this year. Is he reporting to camp today? He should be. Today's the day. And with today, we're going to see what hot, what Sam Levitt's got up his sleeve for us as he will be joining us coming up in the 7 a.m. hour. It's a good day today for Padres fans. What's your excitement level? I want to hear it from you. 833-288-0973. 833-288-0973. Again, Weigh in on the chat as well on social media, all of you on the YouTube chat. I brought out that question earlier. I don't know if I had it up, so if you put it on there, I'm, I apologize. But how excited are you for the season? Andrew from San Diego said a four. I don't know about a four. I'm about a five right now. It's incomplete roster. How excited you guys are? How how excited are you guys for the season this year? 833-288-0973. 833-288-0973. Put it in the chat so we can get some fan engagement on that. Thanks again for tuning in this morning. I'm Braden Serpent filling in for Ben and Woods as they are out sick. If you like what you hear, you can follow me on social media at B underscore SURP. If you're watching on YouTube, it's in the lower left corner. All my tags, all my ats. I'm also on TikTok now, at B underscore S-U-R-P. I have a show each and every Sunday from 8 to 10. Trying to hold off a sneeze. Braden, if I could just jump in for a second here. The idea just, you you, you had commented, if you don't trade Hassan Kim before Korea, you better hold on to him until the trade deadline. I mean, don't rule out the fact that the Padres just have a good season and don't need to trade him at a trade deadline. It's make a playoff push with him. I wouldn't want to trade him at the trade deadline in general. To me, if you trade him, you trade him at the beginning of the season. Because here's the other thing. Unless the Padres are like 15 games out of a wild card spot, you're going to anger a lot of fans trading Hassan Kim at a trade deadline. I'd be against that. Sam Levitt joining us next. Braden Suprenant filling in for Bennett Woods. San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
7 a.m. On a Friday, Braden Soprano filling in for Ben and Woods. They are both under the weather, so I got the show until 10 a.m. where Andy Nelson will take over my usual time slot. I will not be on with Andy Nelson today. Instead, I will be with you guys until 10 in the morning. And then Adam Klug will be here all day as he will be with Andy Nelson coming up a little bit later. Do want to mention in this hour, Ben and Woods usually play take on Woods. We will not be doing that today. For all of those that qualify to take that take down Woods, you are registered for a grand prize. A two nights stay at the Westgate Las Vegas and two tickets to Air Supply. With a legacy spanning decades, Air Supply continues to captivate hearts. Now in their 45th anniversary year, the duo continues to play more than 130 shows a year worldwide. Join us in celebrating their music and enduring legacy on May 31st and June 1st, 2024 at the Westgate International Theater at Westgate Las Vegas Resort and Casino. Get tickets now at Ticketmaster.com. Westgate Las Vegas Resort and Casino features newly designed premier rooms, part of their $70 million room renovations, home of legendary Vegas fun. It's part of Take on Woods each and every morning. Again, not doing that today. Woods is not here, so we're not taking Woods on. Joining us now on the hotline, live from Arizona. We had a, I, I guess we set his alarm off. That would be the one, the only Sammy Spring Training, Sam Levitt, joining us today on the hotline. Talk to us a little bit about Padres Spring Training with a lot of the members of the Padres showing up today. Sammy, good morning to you. How are you doing? Hey, Braden. Good morning. And uh, I have to say, I, um, I, I, so far, it's been a late start here at spring training, but we are back to uh, sort of a normal schedule with uh, things starting earlier this morning. So I'm already at the complex, and I saw a you know a, a kind of like a toll free number calling me this early, and I said that that must be spam, right? And then I, of course, forgot that I was supposed to talk to you at a 7 a.m. local time. So sorry about that, a minute or two late. Um, but yeah, everybody will be here today. It's the first full squad workout. Um, you know, the, the good news is that mostly everybody uh, is already here uh, as of uh, Wednesday when we last saw them. No action uh, here at the complex yesterday, but everybody's been here for, for a few days. And uh, but officially we get it rolling with the full squad workout. And I'm sure Mike Schilt will have uh, some sort of address for the team. Managers usually do. And uh, we we sort of post pitchers and catchers officially get it rolling here today. We're joined by Sam Levitt, who is the pre- and post-game host of the San Diego Padres Radio Network, who is live out there at spring training in Peoria, Arizona, seeing all the big boys roll through, all the position players as they will finally uh, report to camp today, pitchers and catchers on Sunday. We saw a lot of different players already show up. That seems to be a new popular thing, obviously, to get there early. Uh, just a recap of the week. I mean, who are some of the players that uh, – Obviously, the Padres are not anticipating to, you know, wait for it for today. The guys that have already jumped in and, and got some early work in. Um, I know we've seen some different clips that you have posted throughout, um, you know, the last couple of days. But, you know, who are some of the guys that got out there early uh, to start working on camp? Yeah, on the position player side, I mean, Manny Machado was here a few days early. Jay Cronenworth, Hassan Kim, same thing. Fernando Tatis Jr., got here earlier in the week and and all those guys have from the position player standpoint been doing sort of their, their own thing and, and getting work in how and, and when they want to which is usually what happens when it's still just pitchers and catchers who officially have to report but there's certainly been a lot to take away just from watching those guys do drills on the backfield uh, late in the day uh, Manny Machado I think one of the the you know bigger storylines so far from this week has been he looks really good and he's throwing and it looks really good now you know i don't know that it's uh you know full force throws for manny and, and certainly there's you know still a rehab process going on as far as uh, what he can do day to day it sounds like and getting his arm used to the repetition of throwing every day and getting him prepared uh for the the course uh, of an 162 game season so there's still you know no guarantee of anything mike schilt Manny Machado won't guarantee that he's going to play third base in Korea or play third base on opening day at Petco Park, but there's no doubt that he is in a very good spot right now. And quite frankly, when you watch him, 
he looks really good. So he looks good. Everything they've said about him, Manny said, sounds good. So he appears to be right on track or ahead of schedule as far as the rehab from uh, the elbow surgery at the very early part of the offseason. Jake Cronenworth is out there getting work in it, second base and first base. And he's, you know, all over the place. And he said that, you know, like, like you know, he's, uh, you know, said in years past, he is ready to play wherever this team needs him to play, which, you know, you expect from Jake. And, you know, look, I thought when Jake formally spoke to the media the other day, I, I thought he had some some pretty interesting comments about, you know, acknowledging that last year was not the year, you know, he wanted and that he had to get, quote unquote, vulnerable uh, in the offseason and, and really go back into the lab and, and work on some things. And, um, you know, I, I, I think you know, he certainly learned something from last season. Um, so it was good to hear from him and hear all of that. And, you know, then Fernando Tatis Jr. has been out there, you know, hitting and, and doing all the normal Fernando things he does. And then obviously it's been just, you know, sort of light work before the full squad workout. But, you know, the thing I took away from Fernando so far here at spring training is that he seems supremely confident and clearly had a great off season and put in a lot of work and obviously was healthy throughout the off season. And I, I think he was pretty transparent when he talked about last season and in talking about how he was just searching and searching and searching for his swing and, and never truly got comfortable. And with all that said, he ended up winning a platinum glove with the transition to right field. And you look at the numbers, they weren't typical Fernando numbers. They weren't peak Fernando numbers, but they were certainly pretty solid considering all the factors for him heading into 2023. So, you know, I know this is a, a long answer, kind of touching on all these guys, but uh, with Fernando, he seems supremely confident in coming off a great off season. And certainly that doesn't, you know, uh, quell any, belief I, I think around here and, and quite frankly I think for, for a lot of us on, on the media and, and analyzing side of things that he is primed for a really 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 big year so from the position player side most of the guys have been here early and so far so good. Sam Levitt joining us on the hotline here on 97.3 The Fan. I'm Braden Soprano filling in for Ben and Woods this morning as we get a full preview of spring training throughout all of spring training, Sam Levitt's going to be out there in Peoria, Arizona. Today is a significant day because position players are reporting. You want to get that out there yet again. But I do want to ask you, Sam, you know, about the difference of this year. I know it's still early compared to last spring training. And a lot of the videos that you're putting out in a lot of these press conferences, the narrative seems to be the same, where the players seem to be a lot more focused in on the task at hand, where like last year almost seemed like a wake-up call and going into this season it's a lot lot different at least it seems like from the vibe of the team than it was last year in terms of being able to take care of business focusing on what we need to control and and really you know taking it a little bit more seriously than last year not that they haven't but but despite the press conference stuff which a lot of it could be eyewash what have you noticed in a difference and I know it's still the first week between last year covering spring training for the Padres and yeah. this year when it comes to the mentality of this organization? Yeah, I, I think I think there's certainly, you know, maybe a, a more humble nature, uh, you know, around here this year when you compare it to last year. Not, not to say that last year, you know, guys or, or the organization was boisterous. Certainly there was a lot of hype, and rightfully so. And we know what transpired, and we know – Quite frankly, what a disappointment last year was. There's no way around that. Um, you know, but there does seem to be, you know, sort of a more humble nature in the sense of, you know, understanding that, number one, you know, this team and, and a lot of these guys have something to prove in 2024 and understanding that, you know, this team got, got punched during last season and, you know, really – never found a way out of it until it was too late and in, in September. And we've heard a couple of guys, you know, mention that they didn't deal with adversity really well. You know, they, they struggled to come out of that hole. They struggled to deal with adversity. So, you know, I think there's been a lot of acknowledging that, that, you know, that was an issue 
um, last season. And, and look, we've heard the word togetherness, and you're right, Braden. It's, it's a lot of the cliches that get thrown around this time of year. But look, you know, they can only say what they can say. And, you know, so far it's been everything you'd want to hear after last season in the sense of using words like togetherness, talking about finding an identity early. And I do think Mike Schilt, you know, potentially brings a, a bit of a different energy than, let's say, Bob Melvin. Um, you know, and that's not to say that Bob Melvin wasn't preaching, you know, unity and togetherness for his team at the outset of last season. But I do think Mike Schilt falls in line with, with wanting to play a certain way, uh, wanting to uh, be efficient, wanting to pay attention to detail, and wanting this team to have an identity really from the get-go. I, I really feel like that's something, you know, that Joe Musgrove, for example, talked about earlier this week. He, you know, he was saying that, that you know, certain uh, – well, I'm trying to think exactly how he put it. He said, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, that basically certain, you know, the, the, the goals and the way they wanted to play and, and their identity, they, those things weren't talked about out loud enough. And it sounds like those things – are being talked about out loud more this spring training than last spring training. Whereas it sounds like maybe last spring training, you know, th there was more of a feel of, of it was just going to happen. The talent was there. And, and even when they got off to the, the, the bad start, it was just going to turn around because that's the way baseball is. And as we know, just didn't really happen. Um, so I think there's uh, definitely an emphasis on finding an identity of uh, playing a certain way and, uh, you know, playing as a team, uh, you know, certainly. And I do think having a new manager certainly brings a different tone in and of itself. Let's talk a little bit of, more about Mike Schilt. I mean, he seems to be saying all the right things, obviously, in the media. And we've heard a lot of good things about Mike Schilt from the, the players and the staff. How have you uh, watched, you know, Mike Schilt in these ne these first couple of days you know, kind of run things. And, you know, I know there has been a little bit of a difference. There's multiple ways to coach. I mean, obviously Bob Melvin's a little bit more calm, cool and collected. And, and Mike Schilt has a little bit more energy, but how have the players responded to Mike Schilt so far in, in camp? And, you know, what, what's, what's been the, uh, what's been the, the narrative and the, and the, and the vibe when it comes from the coaching staff to the players so far? Yeah, I, I think for me, one thing I've certainly noticed, and, and I said this yesterday to Ben and Woods, and that's not to say that Bob Melvin was not, you know, in a lot of different places at a lot of, a lot of different times around the complex, but I, I do find Mike Schilt is everywhere around here. Like from morning until afternoon, if there's a backfield with something going on, Mike Schilt is there. And that's even at, you know, two, three o'clock earlier this week when there's a group of minor leaguers taking ground balls back on the, you know, field behind uh, the main one to the right of the, uh, to the right of the bullpen mound is getting very intricate into, into uh, where different fields are, but it, it's kind of off the, the beaded path, if you will. And he's out there. So that certainly stood out to me the way that he is just sort of everywhere. And that really falls in line with a, what we've heard about Mike Schilt entering this season and be what players have said. He, he's somebody who is very detail oriented, wants, you know, guys to be both efficient and effective with their time, with the way they're preparing. So, you know, look, again, it was some, you know, Mike Schilt, when he was first hired and, and Braden, I'm sure you heard many of the same things. You know, what I heard about Mike was that he was extremely detail oriented and about fundamentals. And you certainly get that sense the way he's out there the way he's communicating constantly uh, with coaches and his players, and he's constantly involved in conversations. You can see it. You can really, really see it. And, um, you know, that, that attention to detail and, and sort of that player development background, um, I, I think so far is, has really stood out to me. Sam Levitt joining us on the hotline here on 97.3 The Fan, pre- and post-game show host of the Padres Radio Network, live at spring training. Again, we mentioned today is the day that everybody reports who are the Padres expected to uh, see today that they haven't seen yet and uh, who is still trying to get their way to camp via visas because that always seems to be a, a, a thing for, for a lot of Major League Baseball clubs. 
yeah, well, as far as the visas, um, as, as far as a, a couple of days ago when we last heard from Mike Schilt on Wednesday, uh, they were still working on getting both Wandy Peralta and Luis Patino here. So I don't know if we're going to have an update on that today. In fact, I'm just I'm reading some of the tea leaves here by looking at who's throwing bullpens today. Um, I'm doing this in real time. I don't see uh, Peralta or Patino on these, but that does not necessarily mean they're not here. So we'll have more on that coming up later today because they could be here and just not throwing if they're, it's their first day in camp. So I don't want to say that they're not here, but we know they were still working on it, uh, you know, as, as far as a couple of days ago. Um, as far as guys who are here, uh, look, we, we hadn't seen Xander Bogarts here yet, and I'm not saying that in any – you know, in any kind of uh, negative way, I think. Don't have know, to report till Friday, of, man. It's just because you show yeah, up early, well, you don't have well, to show right, up that's, early. That's fine. no, no, and that's and that and that's what I'm saying. And I know this time of year there is some that gets made out of that of like, oh, why are these guys here and these guys aren't here and this guy is reporting early and this guy's not. You know, I, I really would urge fans not to worry about that stuff because a, there are a million reasons why guys come early or don't come early. Um, you know, and, and every player is different. And when it's September 25th, you know, and they played 150 something games, like the couple of days in February, they, they don't matter. Okay. They, they just don't. And by the way, in today's day and age, and Braden, you know, this guys work out everywhere. They've got facilities everywhere. So, you know, just because the guy's not here early does not mean they're not working on stuff. And, and there are a million reasons why they may get here early or, or not get here early. So uh, we had not seen Vander yet. I am positive. I haven't seen him yet, but I'm positive he'll be here today because he has to be here today uh, on the full squad uh, report date. Um, but, you know, to be honest with you, everybody else that, you know, I'm, I'm not totally sure looking at a couple of the minor league non-roster invitees if they were here or not, but most of them, I mean, I've seen Graham Pauly, I've seen Nathan Martorella. I just saw Jackson Merrill walking by. I've seen Jacob Marcy. So a lot of these guys are here. And um, most of uh, the other position players on the big league side, Machado, Cronenworth, Kim, Batten, Rosario, uh, Tyler Wade, Fernando Tatis Jr., Jose Azacar, uh, Oscar Mercado, they've all been here. So pretty much everybody's been here for at least uh, a couple of days. And uh, the, the you know the, uh, the core guy that, that we haven't seen yet is Xander, but I am sure we will see him today. Last thing for you, Sam, you mentioned a lot of those young players, and obviously they're there early because they want to try to make this ball club, and any day you're in the big leagues is a good day. Uh, we've heard rumors about some of these guys being right there, ready to go, uh, potentially to make the opening day roster. A lot of them, not a lot of experience over double A, you know, mo most notably in Jackson Merrill and Graham Pauly and, and, and Jacob right. Marcy in particular with, you know, getting some outfield reps, and we've heard what Jackson Merrill's had to say about getting reps in center and in left field and, and, and whatever. But what have you seen? It's one thing to, uh, to say, but what have you seen with some of those young guys of, of where they're working out, what they're doing, and uh, you know anything about what their plan is for some of these young guys in the next couple of weeks or so? Well, look, I, I think you know it's very, very clear that these young prospects, at least as, as currently constructed this roster, you know, and, and obviously there there may be moves coming. We'll see. I think a lot of us would still be surprised if there isn't a move or two still to come. But right now, I think these prospects, when you talk about a guy like Jackson Merrill in particular, is going to have a real opportunity to make this team. And he is working out and left. He's working out in center. Uh, um, he's been taking round balls on the infield. So he's doing exactly what, uh, you know, he talked about and what you anticipated him to do. And that is, work out at a number of different positions and, and be ready to, to play a number of different positions. But I do think the idea of Jackson Merrill playing, you know, the outfield early this season is a real possibility and they are going to work him out in that way. Um, look, I think they're trying to increase the versatility of a number of these guys. I'll give you a really good example. Graham Pauly, you know, is somebody who has played a number of different positions. And then the other day, you know, he's, He's taking ground balls at first base. He's never played first base. And I'm not saying they're trying to convert him into a first baseman, but I did think it was a good example of a guy in spring training. And I don't want to read too much into it. It's mid-February. 
but, you know, trying to increase his versatility. And could that be a scenario where the Padres are saying, well, you know what, if Paulie hits and he's ready to hit major league pitching, let's, you know, give him a first baseman's mitt and, and see if he can play over there and, and add what he could bring to this roster. So, look, I think right now is currently constructed. Um, you know, I think these prospects are very much being looked at in a serious way. Um, I think there will be competition. And, you know, we'll see how it all shakes out. And obviously a lot could change. If there are trades, if there are free agent signings, I think that's the wild card, as we all know right now uh, here at spring training, is that, you know, there's still a lot that could happen, not just here with the Padres, but really across the board, across the sport. But there's no doubt in my mind that the idea of Merrill or Pauly, um, you know, being somebody who could really impress here and make this team, I don't think it's a far-fetched idea. I think the Padres are taking it seriously, and I think it is a major storyline to watch here at spring training, and we'll see how it all shakes out. Well, uh, who are we expected to uh, hear from today, Sam? Mm, well, you know, it's funny. The, the first handful of days here at spring training, I, I try to keep to – uh, the the kind of the formal media scrums that guys do just because I have so much time to talk to them separately, at least, you know, as far as putting them on camera and recording them and things like that. Uh, so as far as like guys who I think will talk generally today to the media, uh, I would assume pretty good chance that Xander Bogarts will considering, uh, you know, he'll, he'll be here uh, with media here for the first time today. Um, so I, I put a pretty good bet on, on him, you know, hearing from him today. And uh, we'll hear from Mike Schilt, obviously, as we do every day. And then uh, we'll see who else uh, talks. So, you know, the, the beauty of spring training is that every day is sort of a blank canvas. And you never quite know uh, who you're going to hear from and, and what you're going to get. But uh, I would stay tuned, obviously, to all the uh, 97.3 The Fan social media channels. Uh, and uh, you will find out, along with uh, lots of very good video as well, as uh, this team prepares for the season. Very early still, but... Uh, a lot going on here. A lot of good storylines, no doubt. Yeah, good stuff as always, Sam. Really appreciate the time, and uh, we'll let you get to work. Can't wait to go follow it on social media today. All right, Braden. Good work uh, filling in for Ben and Woods, and uh, I will talk to you later. All right, that's Sam Levitt again reporting for us live from Peoria, Arizona, where all the players are reporting today. Should be seeing Xander Bogarts roll through those doors in Peoria very shortly and hopefully he does talk to the media today i would imagine i would assume so too just because he's one of the stars that hasn't met with the media yet because he hasn't been there uh and be looking forward to seeing what he's got to say about the season coming up for the san diego padres we're going to take a quick break we're going to get back into some padres baseball i was going to ask sam this question but i might ask you guys this question instead that involves the padres and spring training i'll ask it when we come back on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan.
729 on a Friday morning. Getting you ready for a three-day weekend. How many of you in the chat have a three-day weekend? Are we the only ones? How many people take President's Day off? Is that a national holiday? Does everybody take that day off? Or is that hit and miss? I can't remember. I don't remember getting that day. Maybe I used to get that day off from school. I can't. I don't really. I don't really know. But I we have the day off on Monday. There will be no live local programming on Monday. We will be live and local on Sunday morning from 8 to 10, the Brayton Soprenit Show. And again, if you're just hearing me for the first time, I am hosting. I host on the weekends every Sunday from 8 to 10, getting you some Padres content on the weekend instead of the usual national radio that talks about a lot of things that don't matter to us here in San Diego. So I'll keep you updated on Padre stuff. I promised Adam a full Daytona 500 preview on Sunday. I'm kidding. I'm not actually going to do that. But we'll have a lot to talk about on Sunday as well when it comes to San Diego Padres, Aztec basketball. They got a huge game tonight against New Mexico. This has been one Aztec fans been waiting for for a while, especially the last time they played New Mexico here at Viejas Arena. So Viejas might blow the top off tonight at 7 o'clock. You can watch that game on Fox Sports 1. I did want to mention, we talked about we're not playing Take on Woods today. He's out sick. Take on Woods is brought to you by Valvoline Instant Oil Change. It only takes 15 minutes. You don't have to get out of your car. For directions and discounts, go to SoCalOilChange.com. That's SoCalOilChange.com. Thanks again for all of you guys joining us on the YouTube chat. We are live on Twitter. We are on Instagram. On my Instagram account, we are on YouTube, of course, and we are also now on Twitch. We're live on Twitch. I don't know how many of you are on Twitch following us, but thanks again if you're tuning in live from Twitch. We really appreciate that. I didn't ask the question to Sam. I was going to. I forgot. But we haven't really talked about this week. I don't know if Ben and Woods talked about this, and I don't know if Andy and Elson are going to talk about it later. How do we feel about the new jerseys in baseball? Have you guys seen them? Nike contracted them out to Fanatics. They look so cheap. They look super cheap. They're like iron-ons. They look like Little League uniforms. I can't believe it. I mean, I can because, you know, Major League Baseball can't get out of their own way. I guess it's for performance. I mean, if the players like wearing them because they're comfortable, so be it. But they do. Yeah, Balsamic, Balsamic Vinny in the chat. They look like stadium giveaway. Yeah, they do. They kind of they kind of do look like that. You know, it's not stitched anymore. That was the cool part about the jerseys. Like, buy your own jersey to pay that $350 replica jersey, right? Got to make sure it's stitched. Well, you know, it's, you know it's authentic. It's stitched. Now it just looks like a bunch of iron-ons. Miles Michaelis was heated about this. He was super heated. I've only seen one positive player comment on the jerseys. And it was like it was like a uh, staged video for like a marketing standpoint. It was Jason Hayward of the Dodgers. He was like, oh yeah, it's kind of comfortable. I I like it. Like the loose fit and it's breathable. Come on, dude. Nobody's buying it. Nobody else likes them. They do look, they look like iron on jerseys. It looks terrible. I can't believe major league baseball is like, these are going to be great. And then, you know, it's bad when Rob Manfred's like, well, you know, they're, they're, they're great. They're going to be breathable jerseys and players are going to love them. I don't know how many players that love them right now. I'm going to have to ask again. I'm going to have to ask Sammy again what, what the players think about the jerseys. I think they look bad. Like, what are the City Connect jerseys going to look like for the Padres? I like the stitch. I think the stitch is nice for Major League Baseball. I don't like this. I, I just use it. looks like a travel ball. It looks like travel ball jerseys. Or, like, you know what it looks like? It looks like men's softball jerseys that they get. Want to go play in softball tournaments on the weekends? It's like somebody made a knockoff of the Major League Baseball teams for a softball jersey. Terrible. I'm not getting a lot of good comments either on it in the chat. 
Nike dropped the ball. Stupid plastic iron-on style logos. Look like bootleg jerseys. That's what they look like. They look like men's softball jerseys you see at the at the Poway and Santee Sportsplex on a on a weeknight. I I don't like them. It's it's a bad look. Well, maybe maybe I got to get used to them. But I just I can't imagine those those flying for the entire season. Somebody said the authentics cost like three hundred fifty bucks in the chat. Is that true? That's a lot for a jersey that look like you got it from one of those off brands, off market sites that Major League Baseball doesn't like you buying jerseys from. It's a bad look. It's a bad look. We got more Padres news when we come back. I, How is this outfield going to shape? We know where Fernando's playing. We don't really know where anybody else is playing in the outfield. Padres do have some options, but they probably need to go find somebody. How will the Padres outfield shape up around Fernando Tatis Jr.? We'll answer that question when we come back on 97.3 The Fan. Quinn and Chris.
741 on a Friday morning, leading you into a three-day weekend. Think of too many answers on how many people got Monday off. I got Monday off. I got a much-needed Monday off after a work of a weekend of working, but it's going to be fun. I'm going to spend my entire Saturday at USD. I'm going to have a Sunday at USD, but get some good work in for the weekend and then have a nice little off day on Monday. Brayton Suprenit filling in for Bennett Woods. Bennett Woods are sick today. They will be out until Tuesday as we will not have any shows coming up on Monday for the President's Day holiday weekend. And hopefully Bennett Woods can be back and ready to go coming up on Tuesday because they were really down down and out yesterday after their show and actually like really through most of their show. So hopefully they get a speedy recovery. Thanks again for joining us this morning. Thanks to all of you that are live on YouTube, that are following us on Twitter, on Instagram, wherever you may be finding our feed, also on Twitch as well and Facebook. If you want to follow me on social media, at B underscore S-U-R-P. If you want to check me out on all social media platforms, including TikTok, be sure to drop a follow. Thanks again for tuning in to the show. I will be back on Sunday with the Brayton Supranet show, which happens each and every Sunday from eight to 10 in the morning. So thanks again for all of you for joining us. We're going to talk about the Padres outfield and the multiple ways that the Padres could potentially line up the outfield with Fernando Tatis Jr. in right. But first we need to take a look at your daily commute on a Friday. Here's Kelly Danik with traffic. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danik. A couple of problems in the North County, South 15. One of them is a truck that has dropped some concrete and rocks in lanes right around Rancho Bernardo Road, so take it extra carefully there. Further down, just past the 56, looks like that center divide barricade has been partially knocked into the HOV lane. Someone traveling northbound must have done that. So, yeah, just take it carefully there. That southbound side of the 15, just past the 56. Listen on northbound 5 at La Jolla Village Drive. It's over to the right shoulder. I'm Kelly Danik at Fenton Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3, the fan. And just to clarify, for a lot of people that are freaking out in the chat, I will not be on Annie and Elston today. Adam will. So Adam's working overtime today. And then my Saturday gig with USD has nothing to do with the station. So no overtime there. I'll just be back on Monday or on Sunday. So I'm good, guys. It's okay. But it's fun. You never work a day in your life when you do what you love. And I'm doing what I love. And thanks again for you guys for making that possible by watching us, by listening to me. I really appreciate all of that. Let's talk some more Padres baseball. Today is the day in which the Padres will have all of their position players pending any visas, which is always a thing. Major League Baseball is a very international product. So depending on visas and getting back to the United States for some players, everybody is expected to be back at camp today which means we could talk a little bit more about some of these position players. So we could talk about the outfield. And in doing a phenomenal job, like he always does in A.J. Casavell, he laid out yesterday, how will the Padres shape the outfield around Fernando Tatis Jr.? It's a great article on Padres.com. And he lays out the five potential avenues for the San Diego Padres. We're going to take a deeper dive into that. After Fernando talked to the media this week, it's kind of come to the conclusion. I think a lot of people have come to the conclusion reading the tea leaves. I'm curious to see if they still give him reps in center field, because I think in the future, the Padres are at their best with their most athletic player in the middle of the field. But as Fernando alluded to in his conversation with Mike Schilt, with A.J. Preller. Feels like playing right field is a little bit more important this year than playing center field. Craig Elston asked Tony Gwynn Jr. about that as we were leaving the show yesterday. What's more difficult to play? What's more important to play at Petco Park for the Padres? To a guy that's done it. I mean, our resident major league outfielder, Tony Gwynn Jr., who has played at Petco Park, who has played in the division, who has played in almost every place in Major League Baseball anyway, said it really depends on who's playing center field, what position is more difficult. And he said, if you got a guy like Trent Grisham out there, you know he could play center field. 
then you know right field is a little bit easier. But when you don't know who's playing center field, or maybe it is a younger guy, all of a sudden right field becomes a lot more important. Which could be reading the tea leaves again about what they might do in center field in the future. Maybe they are going to put somebody young out there. So let's talk about the outfield. Again, Fernando Tatis Jr. made it sound like he's playing right field this year. Doesn't really sound like he's going to be playing center field all too much. I do think it'd be nice to give him a look at that. But it doesn't sound like he will be playing center field. Sorry to butt in here for just a second. I know you want to focus on the outfield, but I have a question for you. Do you think Fernando Tatis Jr. plays outfield for the rest of his career? Not, I'm not uh, talking about right field or center. I'm talking about, is he an outfielder the rest of his career? Or do you think he ever moves back to short? I don't think he ever moves back to short because I don't because the Padres have shortstops under contract for a long period of time. I mean, the only way he moves back to shortstop would have to be like five or six years down the road, assuming he's still a Padre, which I would imagine he is. And then Xander's at first. And they need a shortstop, but then it's like, but then you get Jackson Merrill too. I, I just, I don't, I don't really see him ever playing shortstop again. I could see him playing infield at the end of his career when he's a lot older, and he's fun to watch at shortstop. But he's probably going to be an outfielder for the remainder of time, at least in his Padres career. So he's going to play right field. I don't want to spend too much more time on that. So there's a couple of things of how you're going to lay out center field and left field. And Cassavell, AJ Cassavell lays it out in five steps. AJ Preller looking for upgrades, which they are. Jerickson Profar has arrived. Jackson Merrill in the mix. Other prospects will, prospects will get a serious look too. And again, Fernando Tatis Jr. is almost certainly bound for right field. We're not going to spend too much time on number five because we already know that Fernando is going to play right field. But the things that are interesting are one, two, three, and four. Starting with number one, AJ Preller is still looking for upgrades. That is the number one priority for the Padres, in my opinion. They need to make some upgrades in the outfield. They need to bring in some veterans, at least one veteran major league outfielder. Now, I don't know if you can find him in center field or not. You know, I know Michael A. Taylor is still available. You know, maybe they do a trade. Maybe they can go get a trade for a guy like Jaron Duran. I know that name has been thrown out there a little bit, but. You know that Jerks and Profar, who we're going to get to in a second, is not going to be starting in center field. And you know, Fernando Tati Jr. is not going to start in center field. So you really need to go find a center fielder, which is harder to find, especially since most of the free agents that are available are players that are usually older. There's not a lot of young players available on the free agent market. Most of those players are still under contract or during, still in arbitration. And you want a younger player in center field to, to roam a lot of large outfields in the National League West. National League West is a lot easier to handle in terms of outfield than it is in other sports. That's why, like, Jaron Duran, who's not that great of an outfielder, at least statistically, I think would actually thrive a lot better at Petco Park and in the National League West than he did in the AL East. Again, our resident outfielder of the station is Tony Gwynn Jr. He's played in both the National League East and the National League West. And he said playing in the East is a lot more difficult than playing in the West, especially with all of the stadium dimensions. Same thing could be said about the American League East with all of their weird stadium canvases. So that might be a play for the Padres, Jaron Duran. But we'll see what the Padres decide to do. In the article, A.J. Preller, or sorry, A.J. Cassville mentions that A.J. Preller spoke in the media on Tuesday and revealed that he's been active in the trade market, more active than usual for this time of year, as San Diego could also use starting pitching in a first base, uh, first base DH type. But Preller has acknowledged that the outfield is his top priority. Here's the quote directly from A.J. Preller. We're going to continue to add to the outfield mix. We like some of the competition we have in camp currently, but that's an area we have had some ongoing conversation with both the free agent and trade market. That needs to be the way that they really fill out this roster, in my opinion. 
As for Jerks and Profar, he's number two on this list of how the Padres are going to shape the outfield around Fernando Tatis Jr. I do want to mention Jerks and Profar. I like the fact that Profar's back. As Craig likes to say, for the vibes, I think he brings more than just vibes. I think he's a good player. I think he's a good turn guy in the batting order if he bats ninth. But I also think he's a spot starter on most teams or a guy coming off the bench. I don't think a lot of playoff World Series teams have jerks and Profar starting. I really don't. And I like jerks and Profar. And the fact that he's only going to cost you a million dollars, I think, is huge. I think there is some something to be said about players feeling comfortable in their environment, and that's why Jerickson Profar has done so much better in San Diego than he has in other parts of Major League Baseball. Didn't have that great of a year last year in Colorado. Very hitter-friendly ballpark. But I feel like he's more comfortable here, and I think that goes a long way for the Padres. But if he is starting every day in left field, I'm not as excited for the start of the season as I would be if he was the fourth outfielder. Now, beggars can't be choosers. It's not like we can go get Cody Bellinger, right? I mean, we have to understand the context of the situation. But I still think the Padres could find spots where they can have Jerickson Pro for be their fourth outfielder. And if he's their fourth outfielder, my level of excitement for the season goes from a five, maybe to a six. Maybe bumps up the notch a little bit. But as talked about before, it sounds like he's going to be used as a fourth outfielder. So he's not going to be in the starting lineup. Don't expect him to be an everyday starter. Just fine. Jackson Merrill's in the mix. This is where, I mean, I can spend a whole segment on this. I think if you're going to have Jackson Merrill get outfield reps, now is obviously the perfect time, is in spring training. This is where you teach guys a different position. This is where you get them comfortable in a different position. The guy's a shortstop by trade, so he's obviously one of the more athletic players in Major League Baseball, at least in organizations, right? Your shortstop's the most athletic player on the team, more times than not. And the Padres have loaded up on a lot of shortstops which is good and bad to a sense of like you're trying to find places for them to play. The good part is, is Jackson Merrill is young and is going to be able to learn how to play outfield during spring training, which I think is great. I mean, if they just, here's here's where I differed on, on some things. Because people are like, well, you didn't really want him in the outfield before. Here, here's the deal. If he's going to play outfield at all, he needs to start doing it now in spring training. I still think he should be getting shortstop reps. I still think he needs to be, you know, kind of that versatile player. And it sounds like the Padres are going to be doing that with a lot of their players. We heard that from Sam Levitt earlier at 7 o'clock. But Jackson Merrill, I'm a little interested in him playing center field. I think that's intriguing. I don't necessarily know if I want him in left. But in center field, I could buy that a little bit more. Again, he hasn't played a lot above double A. So is he going to be able to hit at the major league level? Mm. We don't know yet. The one thing I'll say about Jackson Merrill, and it could go with Jacob Marcy and Graham Pauly, is unless they're going to be everyday starters in Major League Baseball, they cannot be on this Major League roster. I'm going to say that again. Unless Merrill, Marcy, and Pauly, I'm roping them all in together. Unless... They are everyday starters. They should not be on this team to start the regular season. Because if they're on the team and they're just coming off the bench, you're limiting their development and they're going to start getting, let's say, rusty. But you're really hampering what they could potentially be when they could be out there in the minor leagues getting everyday at-bats. I'm really curious to see what the Padres do in the outfield. I think those guys are, in fact, in the mix. They've said it during the mix. Jackson Merrill excites me more in center field. Tatis, Merrill, Tommy Pham? It's not bad. Profar off the bench? I could live with that. Something around those lines might be in the works. You never know with trades either. Hour number three starts next. We're going to talk about more Padres baseball. Quinn and Chris.
8 a.m. on a Friday. There you go. Playing some Braden Sopranet tunes on the open. You can hear that open each and every Sunday from 8 to 10. A little weekend programming for you on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3. The Fan, I'm Braden Sopranet filling in for Ben and Woods. Nothing crazy. They're both sick today. Needed a veteran off the bench. They needed a bullpen piece. I was ready to go, ready to start the day, ready to get you going for Padres baseball as position players are reporting today for the San Diego Padres. It's good. It's another check off the box. We're getting closer to Padres baseball. We're getting close to that March 20th day of opening day, which will be in Korea as we get ready for Padres baseball. What's your excitement level, Padres fans? We talked about that to start the show at 6 in the morning. Now, I know it's it's early in the morning, a little droggy in the morning, not really excited, even though it's a three-day weekend. But what is your excitement level for the Padres season? As this show is starting to progress, I'm starting to get more excited. We've talked some Padres baseball off the, off the air with myself and Adam Klug, and we're talking about different spots you got to fill and everything like that. And the young guys are going to have to be a big factor for the Padres. But as I mentioned in the first opening segment, and I was talking to Adam about this, and he's the one that told me the story, so I don't want to take full credit for it. But what Doug, Doug Gottlieb used to say to his wife, or just say in general. You can't judge something until it's complete. And he talked about his time where they remodeled one of the rooms in their house. And they started to paint the room. And his wife hated what it looked like. And Doug went out and said, well, it's not done yet. Like, just wait. It's not done yet. Can't be judging something until it's done. Let's see what the Padres put together. They're still painting their room, right? They're still painting their their roster room of 2024. It's not done yet. I don't even know if it's a third done yet or a quarter done yet. But it ain't done yet. You got to wait for that thing to be finished before you can get excited about your brand new living room you got, your new outdoor patio that you're remodeling. It's not going to look very good when it's incomplete. Did you ever see? We watched the show. It, it used to be on with Adam Carolla. It was to catch a contractor where like contractors would go in and remodel houses, right? And then they would disappear and people are left with this decrepit looking house in certain rooms of remodels. You know, hunt them down. I mean, it'd be like on an HGTV show where you go in and like the before and the after, but the after is still the incomplete room that they're working on. Are you going to like that room? Are you going to be excited for it? Absolutely not. It's not finished yet. Looks terrible. You got a hole in the drywall. Concrete slab is your floor. You don't have no flooring. It's not going to look good. You can't be excited for that. Get away for the Padres to finish that room before I can ultimately tell you my excitement level. But as of right now, as things are constructed, if they played tomorrow, it's like a five. We had Andrew from San Diego call in. He said it was a four. I think some people are excited. Charisma said my level of excitement will just grow as things begin, like members got their access to FanFest tickets, waiting for when we can start exchanging our games, so making those plans and having things to do. We flashed that on the YouTube screen. It's true. James Mullins goes, excitement level for Padres is a 6. Excitement level for baseball in general is a 15. I think the more, the closer you start getting to baseball season, the more excited you start getting for the season. It's tough to get excited on the first day where players report. You know, it, it's it's kind of like those boxes that you check. First day of pitchers and catchers, oh, great, baseball's around the corner. And then the position players show up. So now you're seeing highlights of them taking batting practice and doing inner squats. And then they play their first spring training game, which will be next week against the Los Angeles Dodgers. It'll be another check mark. Oh, sweet. And then the first game that we air on TV and radio is going to be great because you get to watch it and see it and listen to it. Or do you think we're doing the first game anyway? So I guess that checks the same box of excitement. 
And then after that, it's kind of like a couple of weeks of, all right, we're still doing this. Still doing the spring training thing. Opening day feels like it's tomorrow. It's not. Still, We still got another three more weeks. At least with the Padres, they get to start earlier than everybody else. But March 20th will be here before you know it. My 29th birthday will be opening day for the San Diego Padres in Korea. I haven't decided if I'm going to wake up at 2 in the morning to watch that or not. Watch the tape delay after the fact. We know Adam Klug will be up to why, because as the program director, he's got to make sure the broadcast runs smoothly. So I know you're going to be up at, at three in the morning, making sure everything's run smoothly. I know you're going to be here in the office, got your coffee, you and Sam, Frank we'll Marchese. Live, live programming, live Padres pregame at 2.05 a.m. Hey, how about that? You want to talk about local all day. Our program director is going two in the morning all the way through with local programming. How about that? And you know you're going to be up watching in real time, watching on TV, listening on the radio, interacting on on Twitter with everybody else. And I, everybody who says they're not that excited about baseball is lying through their teeth. Because if there were a game tomorrow, everyone would be at a 10. Probably. Not as excited as I was last year at this time. But last year was different. You got to wake I You got to wait. Well, here's the thing. Like, it is my birthday on that day. So my buddies are like, let's just go out. And then, like, when we come home, we'll watch the game. Oh, my God. The old don't go to sleep move. I don't like that move. I hate that move. I've never pulled that move off. I don't really want to pull that move off. I need my if I don't sleep, I get sick quick, which it's amazing. I'm still functioning right now. I know. I know. I mean, what are you going to do, Adam? Are you going to go to sleep early and then wake up? Yeah, and... Or are you going to just pull an all-nighter? Or... away, but we've got some things up our sleeves that we're talking ah! about. Ah! could be special going on around here. All right, so that, that, that means I definitely have to be awake, and I'm definitely going to be up <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> Comes to the job. You know what? Somebody's got to do it. I'm here to help out as much as I can, so we'll see what happens with that. <laughs> yeah, I don't need the twentieth off from that show. I, that, that's gonna be fun. It's gonna be a long, long day, all day, every day. Can't wait for the early morning game, but two in a row, as well. I can't, I can't do the stay up all night thing. That happened last year, actually, in the fall. So I coach football at Cathedral. I know a lot of you that listen to the Andy Nelson show understand that, and have been following me for the last couple of years. Know that I coach football at. at at Cathedral Catholic, my alma mater, where I played football, and now I get to coach football there for my head coach when I was in high school, and a lot of the coaching staff's head coach, Sean Doyle. I get to coach with my dad, too, who's coming back. It's going to be fun. Looking forward to the season. But last year, for some reason, we had to play like three games out of town. Two of them involved a plane trip. Two of them had to take work off. And one of them on the plane trips we played in San Francisco. It'd be up early. JV team went too. I also coached the JV team. Had to be up at like four in the morning. Fly up to San Francisco. You know, do the whole day. Play the JV game. Play the varsity game. Get back to the hotel. It's like one in the morning. I was trying to get back to the hotel. And then I got, <laughs> I got the bad news that I was on the first flight out the next morning. There wasn't enough on the plane that we had. And so the JV staff had to fly and the plane left at like 5 a.m. from San Francisco, which means I had to be up at like 4 something. I had to be, I'd be there at 4 something. I had to be up at like 3. So I had like two hours of sleep. I could have just stayed up like some of the JV coaches or go to go to sleep. I, I decided to take a nap. Got to the airport, flew out. It seemed miserable at the time, but it was good being home by 9 in the morning while everybody else was getting back at like noon. You know Slamarena. I do know Slamarena, Ray. I played with his younger brother, Christian Camarena. Daniel's a good friend. Good friend. With me and my buddies. I was excited to see that, that slam arena. I called one of my friends that was sitting with Daniel's family. He was losing his mind on that home run. Yeah, we didn't bust to that. That was a uh, that was a that was a that was a plane trip. So that's me on the the sleeping as opposed to staying up late. I will probably take a nap of some kind. Speaking of that trip to Korea, we got a couple of nuggets on that 
we're going to get to in a second. But I do want to pick up where I left off on the young players in the outfield. Young players in the outfield. And it's going to be interesting to see what the Padres do with that young crop of players. A lot of them not playing a lot of games in double A. And I'm not one. You don't have to play triple A baseball to play in the major leagues. You don't have to do that. And a lot of guys, especially with the skewed numbers in the PCL, especially for offensive players and position players, you don't have to. It's it's skewed numbers, but you do need to have players with experience, and they got to be ready. And I don't necessarily know if some of these guys are ready yet. But when talking about the young players and trying to get them ready, there's a lot of things that go into them being comfortable at the major league level. Earlier this week, Joe Musgrove talked to the media about what they're trying to do to make it a comfortable spot for the young players to be able to adjust and help the ball club out as soon as possible. Well, I think our our little off-season camp that we do every year in in January is a big part of that, you know, bringing these, these new guys in and some of these young guys and giving them a week prior to spring training to, to meet the staff, to meet some of the other players, to, you know, see what the expectation is, how we do things here, meet some of the behind the scenes guys with the analytics and just kind of kickstart things and give these guys a week to kind of adjust to some of the people and, you know, get their feet underneath them before they get here. But, you know, we talked about it a lot this off season, myself, Manny, uh, Toddy Darvish, all these guys that are, you know, under contract going to be here for a while that, you know, we have a lot of young guys now and we're going to need these guys to produce. And I think for them to be the best player that they can be, they have to be comfortable. They got to be able yeah. to, to play with that swagger and with a little bit of attitude and personality. And I think a lot of that comes from the veterans on the team creating that atmosphere. You know, these they got to understand that we're here to win games. You know, we're not here to make them feel like rookies. We're not here to belittle them or make them feel like they're anything less than our, you know, we're here to win. So having said that, there are, you know, there is a pecking order and there are some unwritten rules that you try to follow. And it's really just respect, you know, respect the guys around you, respect the guys that have more time than you in the game, mm. but be yourself, you know, play the game the way you, the way that you play it, play with some passion, with some fire. And, uh, you know, if your mind's in the right place with everything you do, you know, we have everyone in that clubhouse is going to have your back. So just bringing them in and trying to get them to understand that, hey, we're not here to embarrass you guys or belittle you or make you feel like a rookie. We want you to be impact players on this team, and we need you to be at your best and, and play with some, you know, some freedom out there. That was Joe Musgrove talking with Gwen and Chris yesterday joining the show. I've loved everything that Joe Musgrove has said during these last couple of days, and I've loved what the mentality of the Padres have been the last couple of days at spring training. It's been what they've been needing for a long time. And I know Joe Musgrove listens to 97 Through the Fan all day, every day. He said it on Gwen and Chris. He said it with us in the past. Got promos of it. This is a San Diego kid through and through. Loves sports. And we've been talking about that on air for a while now. What is the identity of the Padres? What's doing things the Padres way? I've spent hours talking about that on air. And the mentality right now for the Padres is embracing that. I'm not going to take credit for it. I mean, every successful team does these things. The Dodgers do it. The Braves do it. The Cardinals do it. That's why you hear the Cardinal way all the time. And that's a big, I'm going to be honest with you, I think it's a big reason why Mike Schilt has had success and why this is such a great hire. That is a guy that has done things the Cardinals way. He was doing things the Cardinals way through the Cardinals organization, spent a lot of times with St. Louis, right? A lot of years before he had a disagreement with the general manager and the president. And all of a sudden he was ousted after a good year that year too. Something to be said about that. We've talked about that a lot. I mean, you have all these players from all these different teams that were not homegrown that have done things in different organizations and try to be like, we did these things like this at the Dodgers. We did things like this with the Orioles, with the Red Sox. Joe Musgrove did it in Houston and then in Pittsburgh. Not necessarily saying that all of those organizations are great for building a culture, but there needs to be that establishment of this is what we're doing. This is how we're going to do things. 
and taking charge for an organization that has never really had an identity. That's been the key phrase a lot from a lot of these players. Identity. Where they obviously talked about it with Mike Schilt as he made his rounds around the world to the players of the San Diego Padres about what the team was going to be like this year. I don't know what was said in those meetings, but based on what everybody is saying, it's the collective unit, and they're all saying the same thing about having this identity, about doing things the right way, about integrating the young players, about having them feel comfortable, knowing what the expectations are. These are all things the Los Angeles Dodgers do all the time that they don't necessarily get as much credit for because they're always one of those teams that spends a lot of money. But they get the most out of a lot of players because everybody's pulling the rope in the right direction and they have an idea of what they're going to do. And the Padres are starting to do that now. We'll see how it plays out through the season, but I love everything that they're currently saying. I absolutely love it. It's a lot more to playing sports than just showing up and being athletic. It's taking care of the little things. It's knowing what you're expect what ex- what is expected of you. It's putting in the work. It's understanding the daily routine. It's understanding what it is to be a San Diego Padre. If I ask you that question to anybody or anybody that played for the San Diego Padres, what does it mean to be a San Diego Padre? What do you think their answer would have been? Would they have even known? What does it mean to be a San Diego Padre? They've never had the history. They've never had the context of that. What has been the identity of the Padres for so long? It's been nothing. I mean, for a while, they had the worst record in all of Major League Baseball in the history of Major League Baseball. They they just they, they keep flipping back and forth with the Marlins. What is the identity of the Padres? I said it two years ago. I said, your your main core guys, which is what they got. Joe Musgrove's under contract for a long time. You Darvish is under contract for a long time. Jake Cronenworth, Manny Machado, Fernando Tatis Jr., Xander Bogarts. This has been, this is the core group of players you are rolling with for the next five, six, seven years. You know, Darvish and Musgrove's contract will end before then, but a lot of the position players, they're in a contract for a long time. It's finally that continuity. Growing up as a Padres fan, people would always ask, like, who's your favorite player? I was born in 1995. I grew up during the early 2000s, right, of Padres baseball. I was in high school in 2010. 2009, 2010, or fall of 2009, so really spring 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013. I couldn't tell you who my favorite Padre was. There was a different roster every year. There wasn't a con- a consistent group. You'd have a couple of guys here and there. You'd have like a Will Venable or a Chase Headley. You know, you had Hoffman for a while, but it was the end of his career. The beginning part of my Padres fandom was Tony Gwynn. I used to tell people Tony Gwynn was my favorite player. Still to this day. I stopped watching him when I was five. When he retired. I wish I got to see more of Tony Gwynn. He was my favorite player of all time. Still is. But I didn't have, there wasn't like a go-to player. I mean, who was the face of the franchise for so long? It's nobody. They kept changing it all the time. They weren't spending money. It's a different ownership. So it's it's not on the current ownership. Yeah, you got guys like Ramon Hernandez, Khalil Green for a little bit. You guys like Mark Loretta. I love Mark Loretta as a kid. I played middle infield when I was growing up through baseball. Mark Loretta was like my favorite player because that was the position I played. But you had Peavy, and then he traded him. You had Adrian Gonzalez, and he traded him. Anybody that they had that was worth their salt. Ended up getting dealt somewhere else. There was no consistency. That's why when you walked around Petco Park up until like the last couple of years when they switched to the brown and gold, you had a thousand jerseys walking around. You could play the game that my buddies and I play. I still we still play it. It's a little bit harder now. Trying to find the most remote San Diego Padres jersey out there. This guy's got a Corey Lubke jersey, giveaway jersey. Is that is that an Orlando Hudson jersey? 
Wow. I can't imagine anybody having an Oscar Salazar jersey, but that's like one. You can see the Matt Kemp jersey still. Justin Upton, Melvin Upton Jr. I don't know how many of those jerseys sold. Is that a Derek Norris jersey that guy's got on? Ramon Vazquez? I mean, think about all the players of all the jerseys. You see it around Petco Park. It's a lot better now because they slipped the jerseys of brown and gold. But you finally have that core group of guys. They can establish at the top what doing things the Padres way is. They can do it. And Joe Musgrove is really taking the reins right now of doing that. And then you implement in the minor leagues from day one. And so when these new guys come up, not this current crop that's right there, but as those guys come through the ranks, they know what is is expected of them when they get to the big leagues. It's a big Big reason for success. I love what the Padres are saying right now. The players are taking control and building a foundation, which is what they needed to do for the last couple of years, and it seems like Joe Musgrove is really leading the charge right now. We're going to get to more of that later in the show. We do want to mention some of the San Diego State basketball coming up. Uh, tonight, they do play New Mexico. It's going to be a hell of a game at Viejas Arena. We're going to get to more college basketball when we come back. But first, let's take a look at traffic. From the 97.3, the...
829 on a Friday morning. Brayden Suprenit, usually on the Brayden Suprenit show, live and local each and every Sunday from 8 to 10. If you want to have more and some weekend programming, tune into the weekend show, the Brayden Suprenit show, as we will keep you updated on local programming throughout the weekend. I'm glad Alex Myers, loving the Braden Suprench show in the morning. I appreciate that, Alex. We're going to get into some other Padres talk in just a little bit. I want to mention spring training is underway. For the latest Padres news, try listening to chapters from the show. Every day, each topic we cover is broken out so that you can find what matters most to you. To get started, download the Odyssey app. I mentioned it before when it came to take on Woods and what the prize was for that, or correction, what... uh yeah, what the prize was for that. We're not doing that today, obviously, because Woods is not here. Also, a regularly scheduled segment on Ben and Woods is Don't Do This. Again, they're not here, so we're not going to do that as well. But when they do do Don't Do This, it is brought to you by the Craft Taco in Sorrento Valley. Craft Taco has some of the best quality tacos in all of San Diego. Go to thecrafttaco.com and take a look at their happy hour specials today, thecrafttaco.com. When they do, do, don't, don't do, do this. this. Say that five times fast, Adam. What do you think about that? I think I'll, I'll sit this one out. <laughs> I couldn't do that either. We're going to talk about Aztec basketball in just a second, Tony. Relax. But we are going to, before we do that, we're going to, we're going to come back and talk about Aztec basketball. Huge game tonight. Absolutely huge game tonight. If you are a sports fan and you do not have tickets to the Aztec game against New Mexico tonight, you are missing out. If there are tickets available, you should go get them. We did give away tickets earlier this week on our shows. Big congratulations to any of you that were lucky enough to do that because this is going to be the biggest game of the year for San Diego State. See, the Giants are giving away Mickey Mouse ears and they host. I did see that, Jacob. That's hilarious. Anyway, let's get to what we wanted to talk about. We talked about the identity of the Padres. I love the the message coming out of camp right now. Absolutely love it from Joe Musgrove. He he really seems like he's leading the charge. I'll have to know for sure by by asking around, but he really thinks he's he is setting he is setting the precedent for the Padres moving forward, which I love to see out of a starting pitcher. Him and you Darvish have been the leaders of that pitching staff, and both of them are coming off of injuries and were asked earlier this week about whether or not they would be able to give it a go in Korea. You Darvish went on to say that he's got a good opportunity and he is expected to play and he wants to go out there and pitch in Korea. Joe Musgrove was asked this on Gwen and Chris yesterday. Yeah. So we've talked about that already um, with Shilty and Ruben uh, about how we want to go about it. No decisions have been made yet, but um, you know, that's definitely, those are two games that, you know, count towards the record book. So, um, you know, we're going to, we expect to be around that five inning mark by then. So me and Darvish would both be ready to go. Should, you know, the ball be handed to us in that situation. That's what you want to hear out of those guys, man. They want the ball and they want that. They got that mentality of give me the ball every single day and I'm going to shove. And you missed that with losing out on Nick Martinez. I think that's going to be a big loss for the Padres. I, I would have loved to see Nick Martinez back in a Padres uniform. I mean, I, I said it before on Andy and Elston. I want a bullpen of nine, eight to nine, eight, nine, whatever it is. I think it's eight now. Nick Martinez is. Because they want the ball and they want to face your best three batters and they're going after them. That's what I want. That's what Joe Musgrove is. That's what you Darvish is. Love that. And here's the thing with this Padres team that gets my excitement level up a little bit more. They got grinders, dude. They got guys that want it right now. I mean, think about some of the players they have, right? They got players that are upset from last year. They got players that want to prove themselves. And they got some guys, like the guys they got from the Yankees are young and want to make a name for themselves. You got Michael King. He's got two years left to control. He wants to, he wants to prove that he's an ace. Johnny Brito and Vasquez and Drew Thorpe, those are guys that want it. They are hungry. 
Let's think about those young guys for a second. Again, we've been talking about that for the entire 8 o'clock hour. Those guys want it. They don't have a contract. They're not an established Major League Baseball player. They are trying to get to the show. They want to show everybody that they are Major League Baseball quality players. They want it. They're hungry. That's what you want out of a baseball team. You want that swagger. You want that edge. You got to have that edge. And you got to go out there and get after it. And that's what the Diamondbacks did last year. He went after it. They went after it. They were getting after your ass. That's what the Padres team has right now. They got hungry players that want to make a name for themselves, that are pissed off from last year, that want to go out there and attack. And the veterans are saying everything that you want the young guys to be thinking. That's the best part. I mean, the problem with the Padres last year, they had, yeah, the contracts and they're playing and they're expected to do well. And, you know, you got some cool, you got some chill guys on the Padres. Their veteran players are chill guys. Manny's a chill guy. He goes out there and plays baseball. Fernando's a chill guy. He goes out there and plays baseball. But both of those players are saying the same thing Joe's been saying during the week. Last year upset them. They're ready to go out there and compete. Have an identity. Have these conversations. Mike Schilt. That's a guy that wants it. I know it was controversial. So I don't want to bring it up in a lighter way. But does anybody remember the Mike Schilt post-game fire-up speech that he gave after the Cardinals won a playoff game? Anybody remember that? Like Randy Rosarena, who was part of the Cardinals as one of those young call-up guys, was filming it. And people were like, oh, he used like, some foul language. I mean, that's if you don't think that's going on in every clubhouse, I got news for you. I mean, that's a topic for it's a different topic for a different day. But Mike Schilt was just like, bleep this, bleep that, bleep, bleep these guys. I mean, he had the Mike Leach speech. That guy has an edge. This team's got grinders right now, more so than they've had in years past. That's what that's what excites me. Joe Musgrove wants the ball. Give me your best three guys. He's getting them out. You Darvish wants the ball. Give me your best three guys. I'm shutting them down. I guarantee you, if you ask Jackson Merrill, we want to put you out there and and, and start a game, but you got to go against their best player. He's like, absolutely, sign me up. Let's go. Fight at the bat rack. That's the energy this team's been missing. We'll see how spring training plays out. It's all talk until there's action. But I'm liking what I'm seeing, and I'm liking the narrative of the Padre. I like the mindset. I like what Mike Schultz instilling in these guys. I'm getting fired up right now. I'm ready to go play. It's great. Guys with an edge. Bring that edge. That's what San Diego State needs to do tonight against New Mexico. We're going to break that down when we come back. Huge game in college basketball on a Friday night in San Diego. I'm Brayton Soprano, filling in for Ben and Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. The big-
tonight, as well as what's on the line for San Diego State and other local college basketball in just this little bit. But first, what's going on on the roadways? Here's Kenny, Kelly Danick with your traffic update. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Danick. A couple of problems here, guys. One of them is a crash on the Market Street on-ramp northbound 805. Looks like a couple of vehicles involved there over the right shoulder. And somebody forgot to return their shopping cart to the proper place. North 163 near the 8. Shopping cart reported in the fast lane. I'm Kelly Danik with Ben and Wood, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 to fan. I was growing up. It was a different station, but Kelly was doing the, she was doing the traffic updates for that station. And she would say a lot of funny things like just like that. Like there'd be a lot of deals like that. Right. And one of the shows, I can't remember what show it was. It was a sports show. They made like a two to three minute clip of all the wild things. Kelly Danik said, and it was the funniest thing ever. It was just like all the random things that have popped up on her traffic updates throughout the year. Just just crazy things. I'm sure she's got great stories about it. But it was like, you know, there's a uh, table and chairs out there on the freeway for no reason or something like that. She's always getting a big laugh and, and taking shots at people for the ladders and the mattresses. And oh, all yeah. People's cars. And she loves to call certain people idiots. <laughs> but that's literally what the tape was. It was like... Two to three minutes of Kelly just being like, oh, you left your ladder on Interstate 5. <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> oh, man. It was so it was so great. It was so great. It's cool, like, work with Kelly now um, after listening to her do traffic updates for so long uh, as a kid growing up. Let's talk some Aztec basketball. San Diego State in action tonight. We're going to talk about all, all three of the local colleges as well. I do want to mention... Um, inside the green room with Danny Green is a podcast that takes you beyond the scoreboard. Join three time NBA champion Danny Green for insight on the association that you won't hear anywhere else. Plus, get the behind scenes access to what life is like in the name in the NBA. Follow inside the green room with Danny Green in the free Odyssey app wherever you get your podcasts. You can, of course, follow my podcast form of my show. All of today's show will be posted on my podcast platform. So if you missed any of it, it won't be on Ben Woods, but it will be on the Braden Soprenit Show. You can like and subscribe to the Braden Soprenit Show wherever you get your podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Spotify. There's a bunch of other podcast platforms that I didn't even know what they were called until I started seeing them populate. But we are on every single one of them. Braden Soprenit Show. Give us a like. Give us a follow. Subscribe to the podcast. It is the version. It is basically everything that we had audio-wise of today's show. You can follow me on social media at B underscore S-U-R-P. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I post a lot of highlights of Annie and Elston and the Braden Soprenit Show, as well as my podcast on Reels on Instagram, but also on TikToks. We had a pretty good TikTok this week of um, during Ask Us Anything, Craig not knowing what something was and uh, what it what it actually was was pretty funny. Um, so you can check all that out on my social media pages as well. Follow us on YouTube. Thanks again for all of you joining us on the YouTube chat this morning. It's been really fun, and I appreciate all of you guys tuning in to the show. So those all are all the places you can tune in to me. Again, I will be on this weekend from 8 to 10 on Sunday morning. That will be my usual time slot on the weekends. And then throughout the week, I'm on with Annie and Elston from 10 to 2. Today, I will not be on from 10 to 2. I'm done at 10 in the morning, and I'll pass it on to Craig Elston and Annie Halbrin. But aside from that, those are all the other places you can catch me and my show. Um, so thanks again for tuning in. Let's talk about the Aztecs uh, for a little bit. San Diego State Aztec basketball in action tonight against New Mexico. It's a huge game in the Mountain West Conference standing. San Diego State and New Mexico are both tied for second place at 8-4 and four on the season. They are one game behind Utah State, who won a couple of days ago against Wyoming. San Diego State's next two games are against New Mexico and Utah State. So if the Aztecs want to win the Mountain West Conference outright in the regular season, they need these next two games. 
No ifs, ands, or buts about it. They got to beat New Mexico tonight, and then they got to go to Logan, Utah on Tuesday and knock off Utah State, a team that they blew out here at Viejas. As the Aztecs try to continue their undefeated streak at Viejas Arena tonight against New Mexico, again, 7 o'clock tip, Fox Sports 1. San Diego State, as of right now, is a five seed in the latest bracketology. We're going to get to that in just a little bit, but a huge game tonight. Last night, San Diego, the Toreros, knocked off Portland 71-66. They're starting to trend in the right direction with Steve Lavin and company. I've been able to do all their games this year uh, on ESPN+, Plus, and San Diego has done a great job of turning things around. And it looked a little shaky at the beginning of conference play. They started the season like 0-5 in conference play. They've now won six out of the last seven games of the victory over Portland last night, have a good opportunity to potentially get the five seed, get the five seed in the West Coast Conference Tournament, or correction, the four seed. They're looking for the four seed in the West Coast Conference Tournament coming up in Vegas, which would be a double buy for USD. Oh, we see what they can do. Obviously, it's not going to be a tournament year for them unless they win the WCC tournament, but they're trending in the right direction. And Eric Olin and company for UC San Diego hanging right in there. In the, West, in the Big West Conference, they're one game behind UC Irvine in the standings, and they will play Irvine next Thursday on February, or next Saturday on February 24th. They will host UC Irvine. But as of right now, UCSD last night knocked off UC Santa Barbara 61-46. to With the win, UC San Diego, a game back behind Irvine in the Big West standings, trying to track down the Anteaters to win their first Big West Conference title in basketball. They're ineligible for the postseason, but they can still win the conference in the regular season. Their baseball team did that last year. And we're going to talk more about their baseball team later on, as well as USD and San Diego States, um, because today is the first day of college baseball. It's opening day for college baseball uh, throughout the country. So UCSD won yesterday. San Diego won yesterday. Aztecs play tonight. Coming up tomorrow on the weekend, the Tritons of UC San Diego will play host to Cal State Fullerton at Lion Tree Arena. That game will tip off at 4 o'clock Pacific time on ESPN+. Plus. Fullerton's 4-9 and nine in the Big West. UC San Diego, as I mentioned, 10-3. and three. And then in the West Coast Conference tomorrow night, a huge game at the Jenny Craig Pavilion. For basically, the, the game for the four seed, Santa Clara at USD. San Diego beat Santa Clara earlier this year up in Santa Clara, that was a big upset at the time, and they'll have their work cut out for them tomorrow night at the Jenny Craig Pavilion. That game will start at 7 o'clock. I'll be on the call with Jack Cronin on ESPN+, Plus if you want to tune into that one. But a big game in college basketball tomorrow involving our local teams with a big game, as I mentioned tonight, at Viejas Arena. Well, they'll be taking on the Lobos, trying to get some revenge from their time that they went down to the pit and ended up losing, and revenge for last year where the New Mexico Lobos came into Viejas and beat the Aztecs. Something that you can't see. Can't let that happen again. What is at stake for San Diego State tonight? Aside from trying to win the conference outright in the Mountain West Conference, they are set up right now in the latest bracketology from Joe Lenardi in a pretty good spot. They are currently the five seed and projected to get a five seed. I bet you they could probably play their way into a four seed if the Aztecs continue to win, especially if they win the conference outright. But just the general scale as we get closer to March, and I know a lot of you are really into March Madness. Who's not into March Madness? But that's when a lot of people that are not necessarily diehard college basketball fans, which is fine, to tune into the tune into the tournament. Aztecs project to get a five seed. As of right now, according to Joe Lenardi, they got him in the Midwest region, which all of this is going to change a thousand times. But a five seed playing App State, winner playing Creighton and UNC Wilmington in the Midwest League or Midwest region that rolls through Detroit. If you're the Aztecs, you want to try to play yourself into the West region because it's in Los Angeles. It's a little bit better than going to Detroit. Uh, or if you have your second choice, probably in the South. Mountain West Conference right now. In terms of you know teams on the bubble and how many schools you're going to get in, Nevada is considered a last four in, which gives the Mountain West Conference six potential bids to the NCAA tournament. Big 12 leads with nine tied with the SEC. Big 10 has six, and the Mountain West has six. Mountain West tied for third in terms of most teams making the NCAA tournament. Phenomenal. Unbelievable. 
They're really close to potentially having more teams in the NCAA tournament than the ACC and the Pac-12 combined. What a year the Mountain West Conference has had in basketball. Led by San Diego State. And New Mexico. And Utah State. Colorado State. Boise State. The Vatarino. Unbelievable. Mountain West Conference, six potential teams in the NCAA tournament. ACC currently has four, according to Joe Lenardi, but they got some teams on the bubble as well. I couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine a time about that. Or the Mountain West Conference would have more teams than some of those, some of those conferences. Alex Myers, we get six teams in the Mountain West. We better win four. That's a fact. You can't just let San Diego State win all the games. But good spot for San Diego State. Good spot to be in for the Aztecs. Huge game tonight in terms of trying to win the Mountain West Conference. And good luck to all the other San Diego teams as well. We've got some big college basketball games coming up this weekend that we are going to dive into a little bit more. With our guest, second guest of the day, Bryce Miller, will be joining us here coming up at the top of the hour. The 9 a.m. hour with Braden Soprenit filling in for Bennett Woods. We're going to have Bryce Miller coming up on the show to talk about the Aztecs and the San Diego Padres opening up camp. We're going to talk some college baseball coming up in the next hour. And Brock Ungrich of the USD Toreros, who is currently getting ready for a little morning workout with the Toreros in Austin before they take on the Texas Longhorns for their three-game series to start the college baseball season. He'll be joining us at 9.35 p.m. or a.m. Pacific time. All of that coming up next. Braden Soprano going into the final hour, filling in for Ben and Woods on 97.3 The Fan.
of the show. Brayton Soprano filling in for Ben and Woods. Thanks again for joining us today on San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Got a lot of good Padres talk in. Talk some Aztec basketball on the last part of the uh, last hour. And we are going to be joined by Bryce Miller in just a little bit. Give me the thumbs up. We missed him earlier, but uh, he has responded and said he is ready to go. So we're going to give him a call yet again and talk some San Diego sports with Bryce, who writes for the Union Tribune, a columnist and a great friend of the show. Love having him on every time we potentially can. Texted him yesterday when I said I was filling in. He said, absolutely, you'd come on and help out. So a big appreciation to Bryce Miller, who now joins us on the San Diego on the uh, from the San Diego Union Tribune, joining us on the Braden Supreme Show, filling in for Bennett Woods this morning. Bryce, early morning to you. How you doing? Yeah, good morning. How are you? Uh, doing well. Trying to grind through this uh, this this slate of work that I'm going to be doing the next couple of days, covering sports all over the place, but always excited to do it as much as I know you are. And we got a big game tonight as the San Diego State Aztecs play host to the New Mexico Lobos. We're going to dive into some Padre stuff in just a little bit. But uh, how would you like talk about the, the Aztecs season so far this year as they continue to grind in a very difficult conference? It might not be as sexy as it was last year, Bryce, but it's been fun to watch the Aztecs in the Mountain West Conference this year. Yeah, it's not just not just San Diego State that's been fun to watch. The Mountain West has been incredible. Um, every night, it seems almost, you know, not every night, uh, you know, there's Air Force and, you know, Lee's been up and down, although there are a couple of plays away from probably being right in the mix uh, for a Mountain West title too, which is hard to fathom that many teams involved at the top. But uh, it seems like it's just, you know, incredible drama down the stretch in these games because there's so many teams that are, you know, playing for a title. There's so much, there's so much depth, not just in the conference itself, but on individual teams. Uh, heard you mention this earlier, but they, you know, how many teams is, is the West going to get into the NCAA tournament? Um, you know, you got to think essentially four or locks more or less and anything else is gravy beyond that. But it wasn't that long ago that we were talking about the mountain West struggling to get, you know, get one, you know, they get one team struggling at times to get two and, and three seem like a bridge too far. So it's, uh, and this San Diego state team is different than last year. It has a couple of the same pieces, but they lost a lot. And as they kind of find a way to see what their identity is under Brian Dutcher, uh, down the stretch there, they're a fun watch. Bryce Miller from the San Diego Union Tribune joining us on the fan hotline. I'm Braden Zipredit filling in for Ben and Woods this morning. And again, a big game tonight for San Diego State. You know, they've, they've really struggled on the road in conference play and have just found themselves in a, in a great spot at home. I know you've had some different columns about, you know, how the environment has been for San Diego State. and called it, you know, Viejas Arena Magic uh, over there. I know that's more of your headline guy. Uh, than yourself, but you know, what, what is, you know, it's been difficult for the Aztecs to win on the road. What do you like in this game for San Diego state against New Mexico, especially after they got ran out of the pit as they play host to a team that they need to win or they need to beat, especially with Utah state coming up next and a very important two game stretch for San Diego state. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, you know, I think in a broader way, yes, tonight's huge. Uh, the time, you know, what the standings tell you, what the, the day on the calendar tells you, what the, you know, the grouping at the top of the Mountain West standings tell you. It's a, it's a huge game. And the one thing San Diego State has done is, is win at home. It looked like that might, that might not happen the other night. You know, they had, a, they had a rough first half against Colorado State, and then they had maybe the best half of Aztec, you know, it is the best half of Aztecs basketball I've seen since I've been in San Diego, uh, you know, outscoring them, what was it, 44 to 11, and Jaden Ledee doubling them up by himself with an incredible second half. Um, so it is a huge game. But one of the things I think everybody can watch as the stretch run comes is I think the long-term potential success of this team in this tournament, you know, the, the Mountain West tournament, the NCAA tournament, they always play defense. That's always there. That's kind of a bedrock principle under Steve Fisher and now Brian Dutcher. But 
if they're the team that Jaden Ladee has to carry, um, they can be in trouble. Uh, teams, teams will send two and at times three guys at him. He doesn't get calls on the road. Uh, it's a huge disparity between playing at home and playing on the road in terms of whether he's drawing fouls or not drawing fouls. Uh, when they are at their best is when, you know, Reese Waters has 14 and Jay Powell has seven rebounds. And, you know, it's those complementary pieces. What, the best San Diego State, the San Diego State ceiling is when he has two or three guys around him in every game who make it incredibly tough to guard them because he's not the only person you have to stop on the floor. I was about to ask you about uh, uh, that. So you answered my next question on top of things, as always. Okay. Bryce Miller joining us on the hotline. But that's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, th this team is a lot different. You know, and they go and they live and they die with Jaden Ladee, and he's been so much better at home than he has been on the road. And you know, I was going to mention, yeah. I mean, how far can this team get? You know, if it's just Jaden Ladee, obviously, you don't, and we agree, it's not very far. But you know, how much of a run can this team make if they do get consistent play out of Jay Powell and the supporting cast of San Diego State, who is not as deep as last year, but still a pretty deep team for Aztec standards? Yeah. If they play like they did in the second half, which I realize is an unrealistic standard because we just talked about, I think it's one of the best halves they've ever had. Uh, the ceiling is as far as they went last year, depending on the matchups you get in the NCAA tournament. The NCAA tournament is so matchup dependent. Um, you know, some teams dodge bad matchups, survive, and then go farther than anybody thought. Uh, you know, there's the Aztecs have had that happen where they there's an upset around ahead of them and they they miss that team, but they had to they had to go through a meat grinder last year. I mean, that that there it was not an easy road to the final four or the championship game, and then they obviously played the national champs for that title game. Um, so that I mean, if they play like they did against Colorado State in that half, uh, they can beat anybody in the country. Uh, more realistically, I think, you know, I think the stamp, I mean, everybody thinks about last year, they made it to the title game, but if you rewind in the years before that, the criticism of San Diego state was incredible program. They win, they win the conference more often than not. They definitely win the conference tournament more often than not, but they just can't get out of that first weekend in the NCAA tournament. So I think the, you know, the stamp of quality programs in college basketball is, is get out of that first weekend, get to the sweet 16. And if those complimentary pieces show up, um, you know, along with Jaden Ledee, they certainly can do that. Bryce Miller joining us on the fan hotline. I'm Brayden Soprenit filling in for Ben and Woods this morning on a Friday, getting you ready for a three day weekend for a lot of you out there in San Diego County. We're talking Aztecs basketball right now with Bryce Miller as they have a big game tonight against New Mexico at Viejas Arena. Should be the place to be tonight in the sports scene for San Diego. I want to talk to you a little bit about, it's been a while since you put this out, but you got to sit down with new Aztecs football coach, Sean Lewis, and yeah. you got to go a deep dive with Sean. I was able to meet Sean Lewis at an NIL event. I wanted to really pick his brain and, and, and get to know him a little bit as well. We talked about Viejas Arena being the place to be tonight. And I know San Diego State really wants Snapdragon Stadium to be the place to be on a Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening in America's finest city in the fall. What was your takeaway with, when talking to Sean Lewis about you know how he's going to bring success to the program? And when you picked his brain, for a lot of people that haven't been able to meet Sean, obviously, what, what was your biggest takeaway from talking with Sean with with Sean Lewis about what this Aztecs football program is going to be and what the signal caller and the man behind the the headset is alike. Um, just kind of that youthful energy. He's one of the youngest coaches in uh, Division One. He was the youngest coach in Division One when he got his first head coaching uh, position. Um, this isn't a guy who's been at it so long that he's kind of worn down by the process. He's not a guy. One of the things I love to hear from him, and I think Aztecs fans should love too, so many older coaches are bemoaning NIL and transfer portal and woe is me. And it, it makes you laugh when you hear 
you know, some of the top programs in the country, uh, you know, which have constantly challenged for titles, been in the college football playoffs, complaining about those two things in particular. That is just wasted breath. Those horses are out of the barn. Um, Sean Lewis says we got to embrace it. He call, I heard him call it an opportunity. Um, I think just that kind of mindset tells you a couple things. He's ready for today's college football landscape, which is ever changing and you got to be nimble and you've got to react and you've got to have plan B's and C's and D's. But it also tells you that mindset probably applies to everything he does in the game, how he approaches practice, how he approaches improvement with players, how he approaches things with coaches. Um, I think you see a guy who's ready for whatever challenge comes his way. I mean, he knows, he knows the history of last year and, you know, slumping attendance and the struggles and, you know, everything that led to the dismissal of Brady Hoke. Um, they wiped the slate clean with Sean Lewis. This is immediate energy. We saw it on the recruiting trail. He went out and got a couple of quality quarterbacks, which is a huge uh, criticism of the program. They couldn't develop consistent quarterbacks or ones who were even playing the position they naturally play, um, as was not the case a year ago and, and parts of two years ago. Uh, but I, this is a guy who's ready for it. He's ready to climb a mountain. You get the sense that, you know, he's ready to go. And the other thing I think a, a big takeaway is I just think that his age, uh, some people would say inexperience could be a disadvantage. I, I actually think it'll be an advantage. I think he relates a lot more to younger players. We see him on social media, which the last two coaches were never involved in that. Uh, that matters to players. They see that. Um, they want somebody who gets their world. We talked a lot about music and he talked to me about he loves driving recruits around campuses on golf carts. And they'll say, what do you like to listen to? And Sean Lewis will say, I want to hear what you listen to. And they'll play the music and he'll know a few songs. And um, that's an immediate connection. So in two ways, ready for the new challenges of college football and the relatability to players, which we're already seeing in early recruiting. I think those are huge pluses moving ahead. I think so too, Brian. I mean, I left that conversation out. It was very, very brief, but you know, from a high school coach in town and myself to, you know, as a media member to be able to, you know, talk to Sean Lewis and, and get excited for Aztec football, you know, as somebody that, you know, I, I mean, I grew up watching the Aztecs, but, you know, my love of college football is to my TCU Horned Frogs as much as I know that you're, you're all dialed in on the Iowa Hawkeyes. But I left that being a huge Aztec fan, which I'm sure you felt kind of the same excitement just being able to talk to a, a young fiery coach like sean lewis there's no doubt and th that program needed an infusion of energy i mean one of the biggest complaints from longtime season ticket holders many of which i know who gave up their season tickets in part because the product that was not exciting in their eyes even if they were losing games it would you know you can't be bad and boring at the same time you just, that's fatal and then you dial in the increased ticket prices and the new stadium they need to pay off in the early stages with Snapdragon. Uh, priority one, in addition to finding the best path to winning is find some energy, get people excited about buying tickets, coming to the stadium, make that environment a tough one to play in. It, it hasn't been that in the last year or so. Um, so I think he, he has a huge leg up in that department. And, and that's not even talking about his, Aztec fast offense, as he calls it, with, you know, very quick play calls, you know, playing tempo, rhythm offensively. I, I don't think there's any doubt. Who knows how many games they can win this year, but they'll be more exciting than last year, and I think that's almost 100% guarantee. Bryce Miller from the San Diego Union Tribune joining us, talking on everything in San Diego sports. He is a columnist for the San Diego Union Tribune. We talked Aztec basketball. We talked Aztec football. Let's dive into the Padres a little bit, Bryce. I mean, the p position players are reporting today. Um, you know, the, the pitchers and catchers reported earlier in the week. And this is a Padres team that on paper is, you know, not as good as it was a year ago. It's incomplete. So it's hard to really do a deep dive into this Padres team until they announce really their 26 man roster. I kept asking right. the question to a lot of fans today of like, what's your excitement level? So I'm going to ask you, before we take a deeper dive into this team, if you were to put out a poll, 
Bryce, about the Padres fans' excitement level for 2024, what do you think the results would be? Are you talking like a one through 10 kind of thing? Yeah, like a one through 10. Like, what do you think the average Padre um, fan would be at based I, on I would think, your, uh, you know, around being around the town? Yeah, like uh, Olympic judging, if you throw out the, you know, the two high scores and the two right. low scores and you find the average, probably a five. Um, there, there's just a, there's such an I don't know, I have no idea feel about this team. Um, as you said, the roster is too incomplete at this point. You know, the, right now between Zokar and, and Jerks and Profar, those are both pretty solid fourth outfielder options. Most teams in baseball don't want either of those guys as their first outfield options, even though Profar, I think, is a little better signing than people will give them credit for because, one, it was a million bucks, and who cares? That's nothing in today's baseball world, especially for a team watching its pennies a little bit with the competitive balance tax. But he knows that clubhouse. He knows the outfield. He has performed better here than in other places. So taking a flyer on jerks and profile, I have no trouble with that at all. But the other unknown is, you know, uh, they need one more starting pitcher. Uh, they need another left-handed at, at bat you know, at the very least. And the, and you're not sure what that pitching staff um, could, could Musgrove and Darvish perform to some of their better days in baseball, some of their best days. Yes. But they also both could get hurt. They both did last year. Um, you know, in Darvish's case, especially getting older. So how excited are you as a fan? Uh, if you told me those two guys made it all the way through the year without significant injuries and Michael King was solid, and they got, you know, one more outfielder, maybe that, that number probably goes up a little bit, but right now it's just an incomplete report card because I don't know how you can look at it any other way. Bryce Miller joining us on the, on the fan hotline here on 97 through the fan Braden and credit filling in for Ben and Woods again. I mean, with the Padres, I mean, you put the last Padres column you put out was last year, was December 30th about this, you know, very pivotal off season and, it really was a patient one for Padres general manager, AJ Preller. It continues to be a patient one with not a lot of major moves. And the only real major move was trading away Juan Soto and the big free agent pickup has been, you know, jerks and pro far, you know, I, the, 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 the article title that again, you don't write the headline, but it was, you know, Padres patience is no reason to panic, at least not yet. You know, do you find a sense of panic? as we get into spring training and they still haven't put anything together. I mean, how, how likely do you think the Padres are to roll into 2024 with a roster of multiple players that have barely played above double a ball? I would be, I would be sh uh, a, a little more panicked than there was when I wrote the towel without any doubt. Um, but as I put in that column, uh, a number of players that late, in the off season process, the spring training process, players they brought in. So AJ Preller does big things late in the cycle. That's his history. Um, you'd be shocked if they don't have a move in them somewhere, if they're not going to do something. But if they look like, if this team looks exactly like it looks now in the first week of March, um, then I think there's a reason for concern. Uh, at that point, it tells you that they've, went out in the market, they couldn't find a fit or they couldn't make the right deal, or they're maybe a little too financially handcuffed. Uh, you know, there's still time for sure, you know, especially given that history of working late with Preller. But, you know, if we're into March and it looks like this, I, I think that panic number goes, goes up quite a bit. I think you and I are both in agreement. We don't think this is going to be the uh, 26 man roster for the Padres going into uh, Korea coming up in, a, in in the next month. You would hope not. Yeah, absolutely. Price, I appreciate the time as always. Good deep dive on the Aztecs today, and I'm sure we'll uh, catch up with you later when we get start getting some more Padres news. Thanks again for the time. Yeah, sounds good, Brady. That's Bryce Miller, columnist for the San Diego Union Tribune. The best part about putting him on is he's got a pulse on everything that's going on in San Diego and a real deep dive into a lot of different sports that we can go with in San Diego. And again, Aztec basketball, huge game tonight against New Mexico, 7 o'clock on Fox Sports 1. That will be at Viejas Arena. That place is going to be rocking. 
and I, I agree with everything that Bryce Miller said about Sean Lewis. I keep hyping him up on the air and I know I, but I'm, I'm, I'm putting my eggs in the, in the Sean Lewis basket. I believe what he says. I mean, the young energy, energizing coach is exactly what San Diego state has needed for a long time. And they're going to get players to play there and they're going to move the ball fast and they're going to score a lot of points and they're going to be exciting to watch. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be different, different Aztec football than you're used to. And in a good way. And I'm looking forward to that. We still got a lot of months left before we get to that. When we come back, get you a quick preview of some college baseball coming up this weekend, followed by Brock Ungrich going to join us in the 935 time slot. If you want to join the show today, 833-288-0973. We'll also continue some Padres coverage as we get more information with position players reporting today at spring training. Braden Soprenit filling in for Bennett Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. From the night.
927, Friday morning. This hour of 97 through the fans brought to you by the Farmer's Dog. Braden Supreme filling in for Ben and Woods. Thanks for making your Friday morning and your Friday morning day part of our, our day and part of your day. We really appreciate that. Thanks again for tuning in to the broadcast. Ben and Woods out with a little bit of an illness, so they will be out till Tuesday. We are off on Monday. My camera's all flipped around. There we go. We are off on Monday. We'll be back on Tuesday for all of our local shows. Coming up next will be Annie and Elston. I will not be on with Annie and Elston today. Adam Klug will be holding it down. I'll help with a couple other things. And we will be running into Gwyn and Chris and hopefully, again, everybody having a great three-day weekend. I had a couple of people in the chat throw out some questions. What kind of offense is San Diego State going to run this year? It's going to be a high-tempo offense, almost like air raid style. They're going to be snapping the ball every 10 seconds. At least that's what they said. So be prepared for that. It's gonna be it's gonna be fast paced. They're gonna be throwing the ball in the yard, and they like to they like to move the ball. So it's gonna be pretty fun to watch, for sure. I wanted to talk a little bit about some D one baseball today. We got a lot of games throughout D one baseball as college baseball officially starts today. It's already started in parts of the country. Duke's already got a one nothing lead on Indiana. For all of you just diehard Duke baseball fans out there, I know there's so many of you. Um, but coming up in just a little bit, we're going to hear from Brock Ungrich, who has his San Diego Toreros prepared to take on the Texas Longhorns coming up this weekend. Talk about a great way to start off your campaign. That game will get underway at 5 o'clock Pacific time as the Toreros play in Austin, Texas this weekend to open up their weekend of college baseball. San Diego State hosts Portland this weekend at Tony Gwynn Stadium as they will take on a West Coast Conference foe for the Aztecs. And then in the Big West Conference, UC San Diego is trying to hold on to their title. They won the Big West Championship last year in the regular season. Obviously, they cannot compete in the postseason, but they would have made it in the NCAA tournament last year if they were eligible. This is the last year of being ineligible. They will play host to San Jose State at Triton Ballpark this weekend. So if you're in the mood and you're just fired up about Padres, but you want to go see some baseball, the colleges have gotten underway. So as you see San Diego in action tonight against San Jose State, USD will be at Texas, and San Diego State is playing host to Portland for some of the local products in college baseball. I haven't taken a deeper dive yet in Eric Newman's team at UCSD or the Aztecs yet. But I went and talked with Brock a little bit earlier in the week, and they got a great pitching staff they have assembled via the transfer portal. And they got dudes that are going to be able to hit because Brock's guys always hit, just like Brock used to as a kid in college, grinding out at bats, just as he was taught from Tony Gwynn when he played at San Diego State. So it should be fun to watch some college baseball this year. So go out and support your local high school in NCAA baseball again. Thank you, Glenn. Turgeon for putting that in the comments. And uh, I did see some people talking about the celebrity softball game. That's going to be pretty cool. I agree. Some people talking about the fan fest. I'm looking forward to that. I don't know why they didn't invite the uh, 97 through the fan stars, but you know, Tony Gwynn Jr. Will be a manager. That's right. But he's also a Padres employee. So I kind of, he's, he does both. And your boy, Sean Lewis, who you, who you've spoken so highly of will be one of the uh, participants as well. As a local softball player that plays way too much competitive softball, I have way too many real questions about softball with them. What type of what are we using? Mike and bats, monster bats, D Marini, Easton. I mean, what are we what are we rolling with here? Are they gonna have good bats? They have dead bats. Are we playing 12 foot arc? Are we paying are we playing GSL? I mean, these are these are all big questions you gotta ask the celebrity softball players. It's more of an athlete one, though. They have tons of athletes. Who do you? I was going to ask you, who do you think is the best softball player, the best non-baseball player, at celebrity softball player? Like on the Padres list? Yeah, it's going to be playing in the celebrity game. How many? How many? Pod, how many baseball players are on that list? But I'm saying rule out the baseball. I know, players. but I don't. I don't remember seeing a lot on there. I don't think there was a lot on there. I mean, they got a lot of football players. Yeah, who do you think is the best of those guys? 
playing softball. I see. I've never seen. I've coached Chris Olave in an All Star. That guy's super athletic, but I don't know. I don't know if did Olave play baseball growing up. Like I don't like that's a big. It's a little different to be swinging a stick. You got Drew Brees. You got Rashid Shahid from the Saints. See, I know. I really Landon Donovan, Andre Reed, Chris Olave. Andre Reed's played in ter- played in celebrity games before. Ray Mysterio. I don't think Ray Mysterio is gonna be very good, but he's awesome. I don't know. Maybe maybe he can swing it. Maybe he can swing the shillelagh. I think. I mean, Drew Brees put on a show for the All Star Game in 2016. He's got experience playing in the park too at Petco Park. I would have probably have to pick Drew Brees, even though Rashid Shahid's very athletic. And so is Chris Olave. Shahid, I mean, Shahid from Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel's got a good baseball program. I don't think he played baseball there, but I know Andre Reed's a pretty good. I mean, he's played in some celebrity softball games before, too. I'm looking forward to seeing those guys play. But a lot of, you know what? I bet you Kelsey Plum can do some damage. Adam Jones not getting an invite? Yeah, what the heck? That's because they didn't want to see him rob every, every ball close to the fence. He was going to take away every home run. No fly zone in the outfield with Adam Jones. I, I bet you, what are they going to put the fence at like 200 feet, 250, something like that? Yeah, Ray Mysterio better wear his mask, and it better not be the one that's got Charger lightning bolts on it. He needs a Padres one. He needs a Padres one. I'm looking forward to that. I think it's kind of fun. It's a different, that's a good idea from the from the Padres marketing standpoint, or the Padres marketing staff, or whoever came up with that idea. Um, That's awesome. Alex Morgan's going to play in it too. Abby Dahlkamper. I mean, there's a lot of athletes in this one. It's not like it's uh, a bunch of celebrities that can't do anything athletically. I mean, there's a lot of athletes part of this group. So we'll see what they got. Oh, yeah. City Connect mask from Ray Mysterio. He's definitely wearing that for sure. For sure. We're going to talk more local college baseball. With Brock Ungrich, the head coach of the USD Toreros. He's going to join me next. Preview the weekend series against the University of Texas and why all of you need to go check out the Toreros this year at Fowler Park. That team's going to be a team that's competing for an NCAA tournament bid this season. We'll get the full preview with head coach Brock Ungrich when we come back. Braden Suprenit filling in for Ben and Woods, San Diego's number one sports station, 97 3 The Fan. Quinn and Chris.
Number one sports station, 97.3, The Fan. We got position players reporting to camp today for the Padres in Peoria, Arizona. It seems like baseball is right around the corner. We're going to be joined by Brock Ungrich in just a little bit. But first, let's get you your last traffic update of the morning. From the 97.3 The Fan Traffic Center, here's Kelly Davick. Well, you know it's a good wrap-up for morning drive when the biggest thing you got going on is a basket reported in middle lanes. Not a shopping basket, a basket. Northbound 5 before the Aliso Creek rest area. So if you're heading out of town, watch it. That's northbound side of the 5 before Aliso Creek. Yeah, everything else around the county is winding down pretty nicely. I'm Kelly Danick with Ben and Wood, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Final traffic update. Thanks to Kelly Danick, as always. We're ready for we're ready for Padres baseball to come around very close. It's very much around the corner. But there is local college baseball in action this weekend. College baseball's opening day is today. Happy to opening day to all of you that celebrate college baseball opening day. Two teams are in town, two local teams are playing in town. That would be the UCSD Tritons in the San Diego State Aztecs. One team is representing San Diego today on a big stage out against the University of Texas. That is the San Diego Toreros, and their head coach, Brock Ungrich, joins us now on the fan hotline. Brock, what's going on? I know you're probably bouncing off the of walls with excitement. How are you feeling today going into opening day? Ah, what's up, Braden? Thanks so much, first off, uh, for having me on the show. And I'm fired up that you're. Uh, uh, on the morning show this uh, this awesome San Diego morning, uh, Friday morning. So pumped for you uh, to be able to get to do that because um, you do such an awesome job. And, uh, yes, I'm bouncing off the walls. We uh, team lift this morning uh, after a team breakfast, and uh, the guys are fired up, man. They've been working extremely hard uh, since, uh, since that last game we had last year um, in the conference tournament. Looking forward to the season, of course, and we got some great college baseball teams in town, obviously, throughout Southern California. It's a hotbed for college baseball, and wow, you really put together a, a very difficult schedule. Nothing like starting off the year than playing the traditional Texas Longhorns in Austin. I was told it's going to be a sold-out weekend uh, for the Longhorns against your Toreros. What are some of the exciting things that you're expecting this weekend, and uh you know what? What are you looking forward to in this in this big series against Texas to start the year? Yeah, first off, if I had a dollar for every time somebody's told me that, you know, and I always come back and say, yeah, I don't know who the crazy guy is that made the schedule, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, but uh, at, at the same time, I mean, that starts in the recruiting process. Braden, as you know, it's like, hey, when you look at uh, you know uh, that recruit that player and the family, and you look them in the eye and say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna take care of you. Uh, when you get here uh, to become a young man, but we're also going to challenge you uh, to be the best, best version of yourself and, and to be the best baseball player you can possibly be when you leave this program. And, and that's playing against the best programs in the country. Um, and so week in, week out, week out you know, it, what it does is it also sets up our RPI. So you get on the road and you get, you get some wins on the road um, against some, you know, some high quality opponents that put yourself in position A uh, you know, for uh, for the selection show down the road. And then it also gets you ready for our tough WCC conference play uh, as well. So our guys, you know, hey, they've, you know, this has got to be the hardest working team, I think, that, since I've been here. Um, and, that, and that starts with our coaching staff. Uh, I'm just going to say that first and foremost, the staff that we've put together with Matt Floor, Mitch Holland, Grady Miller. Grady Miller pitched uh, at USD, and, and he's back as a Toro now. And Mitch Holland has done an exceptional job. Uh, joining the staff, um, you know, from Loyola Marymount and played at Irvine. And with those guys, man, they're, they, they don't miss a detail. They don't miss a beat. And, you know, when you show up to either weights, practice, running, um, uh, class, I mean, you name it, community service, uh, those guys are all over it. Um, and it takes a village. So with that being said, I'm excited, Braden, to get out there and, and just freaking – be a cheerleader for my guys, man, and just watch them show so much emotion and play tonight and support them and love them. And, and I know they are so excited because they've worked extremely hard and they have prepared like no other uh, for tonight and for this marathon of this season.
you know, and, and, and I'm just so excited to watch them get after it. Got a lot of guys returning from a, a successful team last year and a team that, you know, two years ago beat Vanderbilt in a regional. And that obviously is, is not the ceiling for this ball club. You want to keep continuing to push and push into the postseason. Got to get there first. Who are some of those core players that are coming back that, you know, you want San Diego to know about and, and a big reason why you want to go check out Fowler Park this year? A hundred percent, you know, and I think, you know, I think the pride, um, when you have pride, you have passion, right? You play for something bigger than yourself. And that, that's one of our core values is family. And th 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 this group of, of young men, man, they're, they're, they're the definition of family. Uh, it starts with, you know, the Will Worthingtons of the world. Will's been in the program for five years uh, and, and been in and out of the lineup. Um, but he runs the team. And everybody knows that and, uh, his number is seven. They call him Sev. And Sev runs the team. And, and, um, and then you got Angelo Peraza, who's a first-team all-conference player, St. Augustine High School. Um, product fourth year. Um, you watch that guy play, and you're like, God, I'll take that guy on my team anytime. Passion, pride. Uh, you know, just loves to play the game, plays it hard. Uh, Jack Costello, four year guy, um, all conference player. Um, he's back. You know, uh, had a had a significant injury last year, and and you know, uh, you know, which was tough. Was a lot, we had a lot of those last year as well too but he's back and, and again same thing just just tough as nails and, and these guys care man they care about san diego they care about the community they care about the city they care about this university and and um you know you know with guys like that you you're gonna they're gonna take you places you know and dustin allen dustin allen's a four-year center fielder uh in my opinion the best center fielder in the country uh that guy will run through a wall which he's done a couple times um <laughs> He's, yes, he, he, will, <laughs> he will, he will, he will leap over the wall. Um, and, uh, as we call it, like the no, the no fly zone with him out there. Um, and then you got your juniors, you know, you got Ari Armas, uh, who's a junior and Justin DeCrecio right up the middle. Those two guys, uh, as freshmen got significant time two years ago when we won the WCC title and, and beat Vanderbilt, like you mentioned. Um, and they played, they, they had a great sophomore years last year. I'm looking for those guys to really take it, take it upon themselves too, as, as older guys, like this is their time. And, and that, that pride that all those guys have, man, wearing the San Diego cross, um, you know, as a coach, it's gratifying because I know how hard they work and I know how much they care. We're talking with Brock Ungrich, head coach of the USD Toreros baseball team. They open up this weekend at the University of Texas. It's a sold-out crowd for the entire weekend against the Longhorns. All the games will be on the Longhorn Network. Uh, so a big stage for the USD Toreros this weekend. We talked about some of the guys returning, and you do got a lot of newcomers as well. As a member of college athletics that understands the importance of the transfer portal and always trying to recruit and get the best players possible, you guys went out, your entire staff, and, and got some big-time arms in the transfer portal. Go ahead and tell us a, a little bit about some of those guys, including a player that you're going to have start tonight for the Toreros against the Longhorns. Yeah, definitely. I mean, hey, it's, it's not an exact science, Brady, but you know that's part of what the world we live in now, um, and it's a benefit. It's a benefit for us at the University of San Diego. Um, it's a great landing spot um, to be able to have an opportunity to compete at a very high level. And, you know, awesome talent, but let me tell you, they're awesome people. And that's what it's all about. I mean, you get a, you get a group of individuals that buy in to the family aspect, the culture, the hard work, the discipline, um, and the team side of it. it. No one's bigger than the team. And that's what these transfers have done. You know, we brought in six transfers this year, a local kid, Jacob Christian out of Point Loma Nazarene, uh, who had a monster year, uh, uh, a year ago as a division two national player of the year. Um, it, it definitely a huge bat for us. And then uh, the guy that's going tonight on Friday night, Josh Randall is from Arizona. And um, this guy has been nothing but impressive, you know, since September 1st, um, all the way around work habit, uh, again, attitude, uh, taking a leadership role, uh, just loving being a part of the program and, and I'm excited to see him work. He's, you know, he's six four, six five, two hundred and forty five pounds and, and, uh, you know, he's shown three, four pitches for strikes. Um, and it's a fresh start for him, you know. And, and um, so definitely, definitely excited about him. Alex Schreier from Santa Barbara, right-handed pitcher, three-pitch mix, pitchability guy. Another class act individual 
that we have a part of our program that has fit in extremely well. Um, is going to get significant innings for us, potential starter at some point. Um, uh, but he's going to be one of the first guys out of the pen. Um, Vaughn Martyr from Cal, another electric arm. Um, God, he, and he, he just works tirelessly, uh, you know, in the weight room off the field and just a, another great addition. He's going to be at the back end of the bullpen for us. Calvin Shapira, left-handed pitcher from Purdue, 6'4", 6'5", left-hander. Uh, same thing, just uh, yeah, that guy's really gravitated uh, and taking a leadership role to our team with his work ethic and his personality. And he's going to be a starter for us, probably a midweek starter for us here uh, uh, this upcoming week on a Tuesday. Um, you know, the, the, these guys have uh, really jumped in and, 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 and I give our older guys that have been in the program credit. Connor Thurman's of the world, Will Worthington's that have been here for five, six years. Those guys have really, you know, uh, led the way and have embraced, you know, all our freshmen. We have an unbelievable freshman class and really taking these guys in. And, and again, you know, it's not one guy. It's not, it's not, you know, Hey, you know, jump on my back. It's, it takes a village and our guys know that. And so it, it, the transfer portal has been, has been good to us. And, um, you know, uh, the, the combination of that with our returners and our freshman class, uh, I'm excited about our, our, our ball club this year. Brock Ungrich, head coach of the USD Toreros, joining us on the fan hotline. I'm Brayden Sprint filling in for Ben and Woods. Got time for one more question. I do want you to kind of go through, you know, that schedule, especially uh, some of the home opponents and, and the different places that San Diego can help support you and, and, and watch you represent this fine city as you, uh, you know, go out there and compete at a college baseball level and, and give us a, you know, the fans a reason to come out and, and, and enjoy Torero baseball at Fowler park in about, you know, two minutes here, Brock. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we open up next weekend, our home opener against the uh, university of Arizona, another top program uh, with a ton of history uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we're getting that itch. I know, you know, the Padres are starting spring training, but Hey, come on out to beautiful Fowler park and, and catch some exciting baseball, please. We, we love the support and get it, get that place rocking. Um, and then uh, we go to the Dodger Town Classic the following weekend. Get to play UC Irvine uh, on Friday night, uh, UCLA Saturday, and then we get to play in the historic Dodger Stadium on Sunday against the University of Michigan, uh, which would be a great experience for for our guys. Uh, from there, we go on the road to Dallas Baptist. Uh, Dallas Baptist is one of the top mid majors in the country. We uh, we had a great um, Weekend series with them two years ago at Fowler Park, and uh, we look forward to that. And then heading off to Michigan for uh, for our final weekend uh, in Ann Arbor. So that's going to be a blast. It's going to be a fun schedule, Brock. Uh, I got to cut you off. We're uh, running out of time no here. Thanks again for the time. Good luck this weekend. Thanks, Braden. Hey, give a shout out to Tecolote Chef Astro for Ben. Ben's got a game today, my son. <laughs> shout out to Ben Ungrich right. for his game tonight. I'm Braden Sprennett signing off. Annie Nelson up next.